Thank you. I call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, February 14, 2022, and the time is 6 p.m. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. Before we get started, I'd like to thank members of the public for attending this school board business meeting to observe the work being done on behalf of all school district stakeholders. We appreciate the time you took to be here this evening. As a reminder, Northfield Public Schools requires all people over the age of two to wear a face covering while inside a school district facility, including during our school board meetings. Dr. Hillman, we have some items in the table file. Yes, we have several items in the table file this evening. We have an updated uh, operating capital and long-term facilities and maintenance uh, budget narrative and presentation. We had several additional personnel items, including additional appointments, increase, decrease, change in assignment, uh, and we did have a retirement in the table file as well. We also have uh, an additional item for individual action about the uh, updating the 2021-22 COVID-19 safety protocols. Those are the items in the table file this evening. Okay, there are no objections. We will add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Moved by Amy, second by Jeff. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We now move on to the public comment portion of our meeting. This is an opportunity for residents, business and property owners, parents, guardians, students and employees of the Northfield School District to address the board. All comments to the board must adhere to the guidelines set in place by District Policy 206 regarding public comment. This is not a time to debate an issue, but only for the board to hear your comments. You are prohibited from making comments about specific students, staff, and administrators. The board respects and values input, but when it relates to a specific individual or a specific matter, this input must be heard by the appropriate personnel, including the building principal or superintendent, and not during an open meeting of the school board. You will be gaveled out of order if your comments are not in compliance with these guidelines. Please address the board from the podium. After being recognized by the board chair, identify yourself and if you represent the group. We require that you limit your remarks to three minutes. You are not allowed to yield your time to another person. It is expected that members of the public will address their remarks with civility and respect. Personal attacks by anyone addressing the board are unacceptable. Please keep your mask on when speaking from the podium. The board has allotted up to a total of 30 minutes for public comment at regular school board meetings. I will now begin to call those who have signed up to speak in the order in which they signed in. Vice Chair Amy Gerwitz will be monitoring the speaker's time. She will signal each speaker with the time they have remaining at one minute, 30 seconds, and 10 second intervals. Again, please make your comments as brief as possible, but no more than three minutes. Our first speaker tonight is Lindsay Brisky. Welcome. Hello all, my name is Lindsay Brisky. I'm here tonight to show my support for the proposed COVID policy changes. Many of us gathered yesterday evening to watch the Super Bowl where we witnessed 70,000 people stand elbow to elbow in a stadium unrestricted. Then this morning we masked up our kids and sent them off to celebrate Valentine's Day. I've spent hours and hours preparing to present the underreported side of the science and data to this board in the past months, but what I have to say tonight comes from the heart. Regardless of your opinion on COVID protocols, we all share one opinion, and that is that protecting our children is a number one priority. I say that because flags of concern have been raised by both teams surrounding masking and bullying. I think particularly of the seven middle school students who were told last Thursday to leave the building and go outside in the 15 degree weather because they chose to take a stand to spend their day maskless, just as a majority of us adults do day to day. On the contrary, Bridgewater students were able to feel comfortable in their choice to be unmasked and were politely dismissed from the school for the day. I would like to wish a personal thank you to Mrs. Antoine for her pro professionalism. If the first step toward receiving an education is that you must comply and forfeit your bodily autonomy, then perhaps all value is lost. 
Moving forward, this is an opportunity to teach our children about tolerance, to build our students up with confidence and ability to work through their school day without an ounce of fear as to what their peers and teachers think about their personal decisions, to break the divide within the hearts in this district and love all humans equally. We have one week to teach our children to do what frankly most adults can't, and that is to see with no filter and accept all beings for who they choose to be. Let's give these chance to flourish in their futures. To this board, I ask you, please give our kids the opportunity to heal together. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Jessica uh, Leibrock. Uh, my name is Jessica Liebrock. Um, First, let me start out by saying thank you to Dr. Hillman and all of the school board members um, for your continued leadership. Um, I also wanted to take a minute to thank teachers and staff across the district who responded kindly and respectfully to the children and their families that chose to participate in last week's No Mask Thursday event. Um, to date, we haven't been made aware of any stories of disrespectful behavior from any student or parent who participated. Um, and we also have heard from several parents who were very appreciative of the kindness that they were shown. Teachers and even principals told students that they were proud of them for standing up for what they believed in. And I know that the recommendation you are voting on today was in the works before that event, but it made our kids feel like that they had a voice. So thank you for that. And it was truly a great lesson on peaceful and respectful disagreement. This hasn't been an easy road to get here. It has been said that throughout this pandemic that we are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Each of us has experienced the last nearly two years in very different ways. Some of us have lost family and friends to this virus. Others have had family members die alone in the hospital because of safety protocols related to this virus. There have been students who have regressed with their speech, saw an increase in anxiety and depression related to safety protocols, while other students want to choose to be masked to increase their sense of safety. No one's experience has been exactly the same and it is never a one size fits all approach. We have differed on our perspectives on how to keep our children and communities as safe as possible. And these have not simply been ideological differences. They have been around policies that physically cover a child's face or keep them out of the classroom for extended periods of time. We've seen many emotions come out of this and the vote on today's recommendation will likely not be different for many people. Dr. Hillman has laid out his, re his reasoning and I ask you to vote in support of these revisions to the COVID safety protocols. This is a huge step in the right direction for our district and most importantly for our kids. This isn't the end though, and we will continue to keep asking for all parents across the district to have the right to choose what is best for their kids. And that includes preschool ages at the Community Education Center. We hope that this will happen very soon. As you may recall, in December, I stood up and showed you a picture of my eight-year-old daughter that she drew of her in a mask and she took down to show what was underneath. Well, tonight, she asked me to bring this in. It's her Valentine's Day box from school. And she was excited for you all to see her smile. And she's really excited that she gets to share this really, really soon. So please vote yes on the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Lori Williams, would you like to share? Good evening. Uh, I don't envy you you all here in, in your elected positions, I have to say. Um, I, I, uh, I don't make scripts and speeches. I just want to get up here and, and speak from my heart and, and say that I, I understand that there's, you know, major setbacks, you know, decision delayed on shots for young children, which is interesting when you, when you, when you focus on the fact that, hmm, what's the big rush to, to say that this is safe and effective for six months to five years old? Well, because then the um, pharmaceuticals never have any liability issues ever till the end of time. So, so they want that push through get it done, you know, so they're not too happy. Schools roll back COVID-19 policies in response. Schools are dropping mask mandates, easing COVID-19 testing. Um, 
you know, rolling back on, you know, Wall Street Journal Saturday, two days ago. John Hopkins study just came out, says, oh, by the way, meta-analysis, holy Moses, unexpected consequences from the whole COVID, you know, experience, you know, lockdowns. And from a business person's perspective, this has not been an easy road. This has been a takedown. This has not been a downturn. This has been a takedown of small and middle business. 500 new billionaires last year. It's been a great success from a very small percentage, you know, of the population's perspective. Billionaires, trillionaires are up 35% in their wealth. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Meanwhile, our culture is robbed. Our kids are having problems and we have to, thank you, Amy. We have to adjust. My question to you is the COVID relief money. Can we give it back? Our founding fathers, they anticipated this day. Our, our government structure is, is, is aimed at this day where it goes back to the small, to the small county local, to the township, to the government, to the state, then to the feds. We elected you to be leaders. And if, if, if the leadership that you're, you're having to listen to because you're taking money from them is not good for our children, then give the money back. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I see we have some present who are not wearing a mask. We now respectfully ask that you put on a mask. If you need one, we have them available for you in the back. We will pause and wait to proceed with the meeting until everyone is wearing a face covering that fully covers their nose and mouth. I see that there are some who are not yet masked. At this point, the board will recess to give you more time to put on a mask. If you continue to be unwilling to comply with the district space mask requirement, you will need to leave this meeting. This meeting is being live streamed, so it can be viewed from a remote location. Okay, so I'm calling a recess for 20 minutes until um, and give you some time to mask up. Thank you. Okay, we're back from recess and okay, I see we have some present who are still not wearing a mask and we ask respectfully that you put on a mask. If you need one, we have them available in the back of the room. I will call for a recess if we don't have uh, everybody wearing a mask and wearing it properly covering the nose and mouth. Okay, I will move for a 10 minute recess to allow everyone present to fully mask. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, we are in recess for 10 more minutes. Okay, we're coming back from the recess and I ask everyone to please um, adjust your mask if it has fallen below your nose so that we can continue with the public comment section of our meeting tonight. Okay, next speaker is Adam Becker. Welcome, Adam. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Adam Becker. I am a father of three children in the Northfield School District. Um, it's not hard to find things that we have screwed up and done wrong throughout the entirety of this pandemic. Uh, the forced masking of our children is the last thing that needs to go in addition to the arbitrary rules that we set forth earlier, such as uh, six foot distancing uh, and all sorts of craziness that that we imposed upon ourselves uh, via the government. Um, I sent out an email to the board members uh, and Matt. Matt, you and I have uh, conversed the email. I, I look forward to our further con uh, discussion. Um, if you did not have a chance to read it yet, I, I urge you to do so. Uh, what I believe is very convincing data and statistics that shows um, that what we have been doing is wrong. Um, so I'm not gonna bore you with data and statistics today. Uh, what I have is an interesting letter that I found. This is from Chap Peterson, who is a member of the Vir Virginia Senate. Um, and I'm gonna read to you some key points to that that I think really drive home the points that what we are all trying to make here today. To the best of my knowledge, no scientific basis has ever been offered for forced masking. Rather, parents are asked to assume that these policies save lives. After a year, the data on student masking is easily found and it is overwhelming. The forced masking of our school children has no correlation with community health. Let us examine the data points. First of all, there are major states around the United States, example, Ohio, Florida, and Texas. By the way, does anyone remember when Texas got rid of their mask mandates? The gloomsayers and doomsayers were out on Twitter and the streets telling everybody how everybody was going to die. And this was an extreme catastrophe. Well, guess what? That didn't happen, everybody's fine. Uh, which have, they have had no mask mandates for at least the past year when vaccinations became widely available. There is no meaningful discrepancy between the health outcomes of their children and those living in states like New York and California or jurisdictions like Fairfax County, which have strictly masked children. According to CDC data, numbers regarding health, child health in these states are functionally equal an outcome which reflects the fact that COVID-19 pandemic over two years has had no statistical impact on child mortality rates. The residual question is whether the forced masking of children is beneficial to others. Again, the data shows the opposite, that masking has no meaningful impact on community transmission. In a comprehensively researched article public, uh, published January 26 in the Atlantic Magazine, the authors who are infectious disease specialists concluded that no real word world data indicate that these masks decrease transmission in school settings. Numerous other settings by impartial media confirm these same findings. I will end, I will end with this. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Recker. Okay, Rachel Trinka, would you like to share? Rachel Trinka, you're, you're next. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Rachel Trinka. I'm sure you guys are not surprised that I'm here and I'm <laughs> uh, glad to hear that you guys will be voting on lifting some of the mask mandates and protocols of COVID-19. I had a big long thing written up, but I won't waste anybody's time anymore. And um, you guys have all gotten my emails. I've spoke at board meetings um, and I just really encourage you guys all to really please pass this. So I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Hi. We have Diane Miller. You're our next speaker. Hello. My name is Diane Miller. I'm an attorney and director of law and public policy for National Health Freedom Action and National Health Freedom Coalition. As a national leader, I am extremely familiar with the politics and litigation regarding countermeasures against COVID. I am a resident of Northfield and raised my daughters here and they both attended Northfield Public Schools and are now grown and live away. As a parent and grandparent, I'm opposed to children wearing masks that cover their faces and obstruct their airways. When I learned that my own Northfield school system was requiring the masking of children, I was very upset. 
I'm very involved in the national efforts to protect the rights of all people to make medical decisions without coercion and to protect parental rights when it comes to medical decisions for their children. Because it was happening in my own hometown, I worked to accumulate the research regarding the issues of using masks as a countermeasure. I gave a packet of this research and information to my former neighbor, Noel Stratmone, um, because I knew he was on the school board. The worldwide research that I gave him shows why you would not want to have children put masks on their faces. I was hoping the masking would stop. Now I understand the masking has continued and I didn't realize that there was a uh, resolution to lift the masking and I'm so happy to hear that. Didn't know that when I was preparing my remarks tonight. So hope that that happens. I now have heard from and talked to numerous parents who have removed their children from public schools to keep their children medically and emotionally safe. Around the country, mask mandates are being dropped. Last week, 170 schools in Illinois sued the school board over mask and testing mandates, and the judge ordered a temporary restraining order against the school boards, and the mandates were halted. I brought a copy of the opinion for re your review. The judge said that governors do not have the authority to delegate their health emergency powers to school boards. Schools are not health agencies. They are education focused. If my children were still in the Northfield school system, this is what I would be considering. If you review the research readily available, you will find many reasons to not mask a child. Masks adversely affect respiratory physiology and function. Masks are ineffective as a countermeasure for children. Masks have a negative impact on child development and social. Masks can contribute to the lowering of IQ and mask policies have become politicized with financial and political party conflicts. I join with my Northfielders tonight and ask that you immediately stop any requirements for children of Northfield to wear masks over their beautiful, healthy Northfielder faces in order to attend school and honor the parents of children and their parental rights to make medical decisions for their own children. I am committed to working with Northfield parents to remove the policies of masking any child. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Okay. We have Iris Lee. Iris Lee, you're our next speaker. Is it Iris or Tris? Yes. Iris, Thank okay. You. Thank you, welcome. Uh, public schools in the United States have been ordered to public schools in the United States have been ordered to violate girls' sex-based rights in favor of a neo-religion called gender ideology, which also indirect violation of the U.S. Constitution is being taught in place of science-based biology and anatomy. Even the enrollment form has been changed to satisfy the high priests of the church trans. Not only is there a separate box devoted to gender identity, but where it should say sex now says gender. I demand as a taxpayer and a parent of two children in this district that the district pay at least lip service to reality and change the enrollment form accordingly. I sent my children to school to learn reading, math, history, and civics. I've always supported teaching basic sex education in schools because I trusted the public school system. I shouldn't have done that. Instead of using science, reality-based material, schools have been indoctrinating kids, our kids using propaganda materials, the gender-bred person supplied by the church of trans. Gender ideology has no base in reality. It is a pernicious, Neo-religious poppycock that the Biden administration and Democrats, and I've always considered myself a Democrat, by the way, have illegally forced on Americans and worst of all on our children. The French left of center weekly magazine Los Pues published a letter signed by over 50 medical professionals and prominent academics, including doctors, legal and educational experts, and all kinds of fancy people, excoriating transgender ideology. It was enti almost entirely ignored by the international press. They say, it is now urgent to inform all citizens about what could well appear tomorrow as one of the greatest health and ethical scandals which we would have watched happen without saying a word, the commodification 
of children's bodies. The truth fairy is coming and she's not looking happy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Okay, our last speaker for tonight, our last speaker for tonight is Julia Klein. Welcome, Julia. Hello, I am a student at Northfield Public Schools and I just wanted to speak out against the motion removing the mask mandate today. I am very concerned about catching COVID for me as well as my two sisters and all of my friends. Especially since masks do not just protect yourself but also all of the people around you, I strongly support keeping the mask mandate in place at least until the end of the school year with potentially some exceptions for special cases such as elementary schools where children are much like much less likely to both catch COVID, transmit COVID and get severe cases of COVID that can result in permanent injury or death as well as for cases such as special ed classrooms in which maybe tr contact tracing as is more is easily more well done as well as cases in which students need masks removed for social development reasons. I'm done. Thank you, Julia. Okay, that concludes the public comment section of our meeting tonight. We move on to announcements and recognitions. Board members, do you have any? And no more thing. May I go mine first? On you first? Okay. Dr. Hellman, would you like to share? Yes. <clears throat> we have several announcements this evening. First, we'd like to congratulate the following student athletes on earning their trips to state. We want to congratulate our gymnast, Julie Harris, on the floor, and Sydney Peterson on the floor, and Paige Meyer on the bars. Congratulations to our Raider gymnasts for earning a trip to the state uh, competition. Uh, we also want to. Uh, Sorry, we would ask you to be careful with the side comments and the talking in the audience. We can hear you up here and it's impeding our, our meeting. Thank you so much. We also wanna congratulate uh, Sam Folland who is going to go to state as a Nordic skier. Uh, these students really work hard and earning a trip to state is a pretty prestigious thing in these events. So congratulations to Jolie, Sydney, Paige and Sam on their trips to state. And we wanna congratulate two teams who have really been dominant uh, the Raider wrestling team just won the Big Nine Conference Championship uh, in decisive fashion. And uh, we want to congratu congratulate our boys swim and dive team who won third place at the true team meet at the state event. And that's where you, it's a true team event where all the points are counted and it's not an, more of an individual competition, which swimming is in often uh, time. So congratulations to our wrestlers and our swimmers. And then uh, the Northfield Area All School Art Show has returned for 2022. The show is titled Better Together and runs February 9th through March 12th. The gallery hours are Wednesday to Friday, noon to 5 p.m., and then Saturday is 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The public reception and the celebration will be held on Saturday, February 26th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., with the district art teachers on hand to greet you uh, throughout the event. And we hope that the community can find a time uh, to see the gallery work and just the incredible art that is completed by our student artists. So uh, we strongly encourage members of the public to head down to the Northfield Art Skill to see that amazing display of student talent. And those are the announcements that I have this evening. Very nice, thank you so much. We have any other announcements and just interrupt quickly. If your mask has slipped below your nose, I ask you to please adjust it before we go on. Thank you so much. Okay, Amy. Well, I am excited to announce that our own superintendent, Matt Hillman, has received the MASA, which is the Minnesota Association of, um, of uh, Minnesota well, administrators. administrators, sorry, um, the Administrator of Excellence Award for 2022. And each year, this award honors an administrator from each of the nine MASA regions. The person selected is representative of the leadership excellence found in MASA members, exhibits a willingness to risk, possesses strong communication skills, and is a progressive change agent and has high expectations for self and others. So congratulations, Matt. We're very proud of you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other announcements, recognitions? I wanted to bring up, um, I saw in the paper that Miss Olivier, the middle school music teacher, I know she was recognized or she was uh, recognized back in August and the paper featured her again recently. And so I wanted to just recognize her and celebrate teacher her year, for yeah. teacher of the year. Yeah, and she'll find out um, in May, I believe is when they hand out that award. So just uh, proud of her and um, we're very lucky to have her in our community. Any other announcements? We are going to move on to items for discussion and reports. Board members, the first two items for discussion and reports are the proposed 2022-2023 operating capital and long-term facilities maintenance budget followed by the long-term facilities maintenance 10-year plan. At our next meeting, we'll be asked to adopt the budget and approve the LTFM plan so that it can be submitted to the Department of Education. Val Murdisoff, Director of Finance, and Cole Nelson, Director of Buildings and Grounds, will share tonight's presentations and can answer any board members' questions. Val and Cole, will you please present on the proposed 2022-2023 Operating Capital and LTFM budget. Good evening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the capital and long-term facilities maintenance budget proposed for next year. So just a reminder of what uh, we consider capital. Um, our operating capital lease levy and capital levy are all um, restricted in our operating capital fund. Um, operating capital is a mix of levy and aid. It is a student driven formula. Lease levy is the amount that we are authorized by the state to levy for very specific leases um, that we have. Um, for example, the ice arena for the boys and girls oh hockey. What? Is it, oh, there you go, much better. Sorry, a yep. little bit closer. Um, and then the capital levy is our voter approved $750,000 levy that we use uh, for technology and some other allowable uses. Long-term facility maintenance is in its own restricted account. That actually began in fiscal year 17 and replaced the health and safety and deferred maintenance um, revenue streams that we had. The long-term facility maintenance, just for reference, is roughly a million dollars more per year than what we were receiving with um, health and safety and deferred maintenance. So these are... Um, presented separately and approved separately for a couple different reasons. Um, the first being that the Department of Ed requires us to do so. And the second, having the approval in February actually allows uh, Director Nelson and his team to get ahead of the game, get quotes and bids for all of the projects and things that we're gonna work on to make sure that we're getting um, the best rates and the schedules because all school districts do the vast majority of their work in the summer. So getting ahead of that um, has been really helpful for the past several years when we've done that. So these funds are both restricted, not only in the sense that there are very specific um, restrictions to what we can spend the funds on, but they are also in their own accounts and tracked separately. So we can only use those funds for those purposes. And they are part of the general fund. So while we're presenting it separately, approving it separately, you will see it in the general fund budget as well. Um, and we'll talk about that when that's presented. And then each year we do have a capital committee that um, prioritizes a small portion of the operating capital. Um, this is a group of um, stakeholders across the district that looks at all of the needs and comes to consensus on what needs to be prioritized district-wide. So this is the total revenue. It's about just shy of $3.3 million. You can see operating capital is about $770,000. Lease levy is about $407,000. And then the capital levy, um, the voter approved levy is $750,000. And then the long-term facilities maintenance is just about $1.3 million. The operating capital will... Um, be declining over the next couple of years while our enrollment is declining. The long-term facility maintenance is also a student enrollment driven calculation. You will see that decline. We have also taken off um, a small percentage for the middle school roof bond that was approved um, at the last meeting or the meeting before. So 
that's what's driving the, the most of these changes. So specific for the capital fund, um, these are the expenditures and you can see two years of actual history, our current revised budget, and then what we're proposing for 22-23. The label on the second line got cut off somehow. So I apologize for that, but it is the um, leases for both Spring Creek and the shop. Um, you can see that's a consistent dollar amount for the last couple of years. The lease facility space is the total for our leases. It does not match the total for the revenue because we are not allowed to levy for any operating costs that are included in the lease total. So there's a small percentage that the district pays for out of the operating capital that is not reimbursed by the levy. Technology leases covers our iPads and laptops across the district. Schools and programs is the allocation um, that allows each building to have some discretionary capital to choose how they would like to spend that in their buildings, as well as some specific programs, such as our um, technology and engineering department, music, activities, that sort of thing. Textbooks and digital curriculum is managed by um, Director of Instructional Services, Hope Langston. There is some um, upcoming instructional implementation. So that amount is increased, you can see, to 250,000 for next year. I believe it's science, but I could be wrong about that. Um, network administration, I included on here so you could see, this is um, the only group of salaries that we are, that is eligible for this fund. We have used this historically to help offset expenditures in the general fund as needed. We do not have it proposed in the 22-23 budget because we wanted to ensure that those were included in the priority-based budget process in total. And then the Gleason property was a one-time expenditure in the 1920 school year. Um, and that was to buy the um, three acres that are adjacent to the shop lease. Um, you have to, to drive through that to get to the shop, so that made the most sense. And then the capital committee allocation obviously can vary from year to year, depending on what is available. In 2021, the number is quite low, um, primarily because we did not do as much as we had planned because of the pandemic. Um, there were lots of other things that we were attending to during that time. Um, so you can see for 22-23, we have proposed about 613,000 that the committee allocated. And then for LTFM, um, these are the, the numbers are the actual codes that the Department of Ed requires us to use and categorize expenses. So you can see what our plan is um, by the different categories. <coughs> um, basically from, uh, 363 and above, those are the old health and safety codes. So there's still a structure in place to continue those very specific expenditures that require our annual um, elevator inspections and all of those kind of standard things that we're required to do. And then the lower half of the expenditures are the projects mm -hmm. that um, Director Nelson and myself prioritize across <coughs> the district based on the funding we have available. So you can see there is a very large $1 million project um, and I have the projects listed on the next page. And so we'll talk through some of those, um, but about 1.6 million is what we're anticipating. Um, oh, I skipped the slides, I forgot about the pictures. Um, so this is just a couple of snapshots of what this money does accomplish for the district. I know it's not very glamorous to look at the numbers all the time, um, but to see the actual results in the building, I think is um, a good way to wrap that up. So we actually um, remodeled the old district office um, and renovated that into the shared MTSS and torch student suite. And then the other half of that space is now for the technology services department. We also updated eight of the bathrooms at the high school which I'm sure you are aware was much needed. Um, and so those clearly look beautiful now. Uh, we also replaced the middle school pool windows, um, which I think were original to when that was built and resurfaced 
the uh, middle school tennis courts. So lots of good things around the district. Um, so our upcoming projects, in the capital side of things, um, a science room addition at Bridgewater. And I wanna be really clear, we're not adding to the building. We are using, um, likely remodeling a room in the media center or adding a room within the media center um, to make sure that that space is um, comparable to the other two elementaries and has the appropriate things that we need for science. Um, we'll be replacing a large plow truck updating radios for the district, uh, replacing a riding scrubber, panel sander for high school wood shop and a CNC plasma table. Um, there's lots of other little things, but those are kind of the big ones. You can see there's quite a wide variety of um, recommendations there. And then for long-term facility maintenance, we will be remodeling the high school main office this summer. Um, we've been working with Wolden Knudsen on this project, and that is currently estimated at about $950,000. So that is the vast majority of what we'll be doing. Um, but then, like I referenced with health and safety, there's annual inspections and testing. Um, we'll be replacing some flooring in the music and media rooms at Bridgewater, resurfacing the track, and then um, just our kind of annual patching and repairing of pavement. So overall, those are kind of the upcoming projects. Um, and so when you pull that all together, you can see kind of where our fund balance has been historically. Um, our goal as a district has been to maintain at least $200,000 in the operating capital and $600,000 in the long-term facility maintenance. So for the proposed 22-23, we are um, projecting to deficit spend the operating capital but the anticipated fund balance is still 478,000, which is well above the goal. And then for long-term facility maintenance, again, projecting to spend that down as well, but again, ending at 704,000, which is above the goal of 600. So feeling very confident um, with the strong reserves. Um, it allows us the flexibility if something really did come up um, that was unforeseen that we could respond to those as needed. And then this is the LCFM 10 year plan. I think this is a second item on your agenda, um, but we're going to kind of talk about them together. Um, and then Director Nelson is here as well to answer any other specific questions you have. So this is a requirement of the LCFM revenue. So we have to submit a 10 year plan to the Minnesota Department of Ed to receive the funding. They do not come out with the forms for this until about July. And so we have the last probably two years um, done it as a part of this meeting when we're already presenting the budget and talking about it. And then we basically transfer these numbers onto the forms in July when they're available and then submit that um, on behalf of the district. So as you can see, the 21 and 22 school years, um, Obviously 22 through 2032 are estimates at this time, but you can see what actually happened in 2021. And then the 2023 are the numbers that I just presented ending with about 704,000. And then it just goes through um, a forecast of the major um, replacements we're anticipating. Um, obviously anything past three years is a pretty big estimate at this point. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're on track for the larger items such as roofs um, and that sort of thing. So overall, um, pretty consistent um, expenditures throughout. We do know that we're gonna have several things with the high school that would qualify under the long-term facility maintenance. And so some of that is planned for as well, um, but that's what this document is for. So I think that is everything. So if you have any specific questions, um, Dr. Nelson or myself would be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Board members, any questions? Amy. I think I'm repeating back just what you said to me, but um, the reason why our ending fund balance is going up and up is just to save it for a new roof if we need it. Do we, do we have an expectation of when we need another new roof or we're just saving it as a sort of a rainy day fund? Um, I think really any amount we can save 
and not have to bond for anything is um, the best strategy because then we're not paying all of the interest and the fees for the processing. I, do you know off the top of your head what our next roof on the schedule is? Well, I don't know the top. Yeah, I think um, air handling units in particular can be a little expensive depending on how how you replace it. So um, it's really just sort of a a long term strategy to make sure we have everything to cover it. We look, I would say, more intensely at the three year to make sure that we have enough for the projects that we know are coming in the near future. If that makes sense. Great, thank you. Thank you, Beth. All right, thanks for the report. Can you explain a little bit on how, you know, the money that we have, and I know we have 10 year plans on facilities versus going out for a new bond for something. I mean, how does that work where we can effectively use, you know, our 10 year plan to update or whatever our needs are, obviously they're like, say the high school or whatever it is. Um, and then, is there a difference between going out for a bond for maintenance and a bond for building? I mean, it's kind of like, cause you know what I'm saying? I, I'm sure there is. And it's just kind of like, how do we leverage that into our best plan for um, let's say the high school, for example. And I, and I was here talking to Matt the other day and it sounds kind of geeky, but I, those pictures of the school up there, all of them, I, I think we should have, cause not many people come into this office or are in here, but I mean, it'd be nice to have all of those, pictures up of the whole, um, you know, all our, all our buildings somewhere. I don't know if it'd be at the senior high or something else. Cause it's just, it, I mean, I think it's kind of neat to look at it, but I'm still amazed when you look at that picture, how well built and how nice looking, especially after the improvements that this building, you know, has done. And that's just, that's just a, you know, kudos to quality construction when they built it. But uh, anyway, I'll let you comment on that. Sure. So a um, couple different questions in there um, that I'll, that I'll talk to. So um, if you recall, when we did the bond for the elementary projects, we had a set scope and a dollar amount. Um, and then we actually infused about $1.8 million of our LTFM to enhance what we were doing because the contractors were already going to be there and on site. And it was a way to save money. We could have done those projects separately, but it would have been at an additional cost. So we Graded is the term that I would probably use the funds together to enhance the project. So that is one option that we could do with whatever the decision for the future of the high school is. Um, we can choose to ask the voters for uh, an amount of money and then supplement it with LTFM to kind of maximize the, um, the things that we could do there. Another option is the LTFM bond, which is what we did for the middle school roof. Um, that I would say is a little more limited because we are committing our LTFM revenue for an extended period of time. We are currently at about 17% of our total revenue. Um, I would be concerned about doing much more than that because it really limits what we can do annually um, year over year, but that is an option that the district has. So those are kind of the two avenues I would see. Um, as, as a way to support the um, whatever the decision is for the high school. And that's true of any, any of the district facilities. Yep. Julie. Oh, thank you, Val and um, Cole for your work. I, a uh, couple of things that I appreciate about the plan is how there's always been um, a um, awareness of how the different buildings might um, be different in terms of the facility. And, and then the example of that, of course, is adding the science space at Bridgewater. And, and um, that's, that's, that's really good because we're just providing that, you know, equitable opportunities for those, for students in those buildings. I know we've done that before with music in the past and certainly drove a lot of the plan around the new buildings in terms of making sure those spaces um, we're, we're equitable. Um, the long-term facilities maintenance 10-year plan, the revenue um, that you're forecasting, 
I'm assuming is revenue that you based on where you anticipated per pupil count and that you likely used Hazel Reinhardt's demographic study to, to estimate that. And knowing you, that was probably conservative, correct? Okay. Yes, I actually used my enrollment projection, um, but I verified it against Hazel's and mine is more conservative up front, um, but in total we came out pretty close. And so I, I stayed with my numbers sure. because that's what I presented. Um, so that, that decline that you're seeing is partially enrollment based um, and partially the percentage of the bond revenue that comes off the top. Okay, then I was going to have um, Cole speak a little bit about the capital committee and the work that, that they're charged to do, who's on that committee. And I know there's always a lot more projects than can be funded. So it's um, the committee work is great. We don't highlight it enough. And so if you just wanna speak a little bit about their work and um, you know, how they determine to spend you know, those limited resources. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, being my first year being a part of it. I thought it was a very collaborative way to kind of gauge the needs of the district and and to kind of understand what the needs are in the buildings. They know their facilities best. So it's a group of all the admin from across the district and 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 the other leadership team. So like you said, there's a lot of projects that have come onto the list um, and we all kind of sit down and go around the table to uh, kind of discuss the needs and, and hear, um, hear the needs from all the different buildings. Um, and then kind of as a group, we determine what what is a very important to the district and what kind of goes back to our, our true needs for the year and, and then start to zero in uh, what projects we're going to take on for the coming year. And, and uh, like I said, it was a very collaborative, collaborative group work. And, and uh, at the end of the day, everyone walks away and happy with all the decisions that are made. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, I'd like to just add and point out, if you take a look at the upcoming projects that Val had in the document, I think it really does show for people who are watching, it does show the breadth of what we fund. So it isn't just, I think when we think of capital, it, we solely think of facilities, right? So people think of remodeling and things like that. But if you take a look at the list, you know, we're talking about enhancing instruction as well by modifying and making sure that Bridgewater has a science room that is similar to what Spring Creek and Greenville Park. We have a science curriculum, science specialists having, we've always prioritized having similar facilities like that across the system. And that's something that, in a lot of cases, our own people can do some of that work at least to get started. Um, also, people forget that we have vehicles. So replacing trucks is an important piece. We always buy used. I mean, we're never buying something brand new. Um, communication, things like radios, but then also investing in career tech ed by replacing equipment in the high school shop that can only come from the capital. I mean, it's too expensive to come from the high school fund, right? So uh, the CNC plasma table and the panel sander, those are things showing our dedication and our updating of the equipment in those areas. So I think sometimes people only think, they only see the tuck pointing, they only see the patching and the repairing, but they don't see some of these other kinds of things that have instructional um, impact. So, and I'll also take this as the time to remind people that uh, the long-term facilities maintenance revenue law has been a game changer for school districts. As Val said, it made a big difference in what we were able to deliver on for the community with the elementary bonds. And I'll take it as my annual reminder that, that the chief author of that bill was Senator Kevin Dahl, who is a teacher at our high school during his time in the Senate. And that single bill had a significant impact um, on every school district in Minnesota and their taxpayers. And so if we don't believe in what the power of legislation can do, the LTFM in my career is probably one of the most significant changes that have been made for schools and we're getting the results from it. Fantastic. Board members, any more questions or comments? Amy. I'm curious about two things. Um, first, how much does a used plow truck cost? And secondly, what's the million dollar project? You told us you were gonna tell us about it, but I, I never figured out what it was. I did, it is the high school office remodel at about 950,000. Okay. The difference is a few smaller projects that um, I didn't list out specifically. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, plow trucks, well, as you can tell, if you search for vehicles, are, are kind of a it's kind of a, a game at this point. But um, we're looking at about I believe it was fifty five thousand, and we'll also be trading in a couple couple of our trucks that we currently have that are older, um, and this to get you know a, a used plow truck for the ground team. So. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? 
All right, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item, which is a great segue for Dr. Hillman and Director Murdistoff. will take us through the budget prioritization process. Yes, yeah, so in your packet, you have a, an overview of the budget planning and prioritization process that we'll be conducting over the next couple of months. And again, we always start with a purpose. We always start with a why. And I've written the purpose statement to say that uh, the purpose is to adjust Northfield Public Schools expenditures to align with reduced revenue resulting from declining enrollment. Uh, at the last board meeting, you heard from Hazel Reinhardt. If people in the audience or watching on TV have not uh, watch that from the last board meeting. I strongly recommend you go about to the 18 minute, 25 second mark and watch Hazel's report. Uh, it's fascinating on a number of levels. And in addition, it really lays out that we are gonna see around a 400 student decline over the next 10 years. And just to remind people that 400 student decline is really related to birth rates, uh, lower birth rates, uh, housing limitations within the community, and so those are the two main items that we're seeing for the reduced uh, enrollment over the next 10 years. In fact, as you know, uh, public schools across the country last year saw a decline in enrollment. And I just wanna uh, reiterate what Hazel said is that Northfield Public Schools got our students back from that blip, right? The 2020-21 the or the 2020 blip uh, that saw many schools across the country lose enrollment. Our students generally came back. This declining enrollment piece is not about that. This declining enrollment piece is really around birth rates and it is also about housing inventory. Uh, so that is a significant piece. We also wanna share that we do start this position from a, or this process with a position of financial strength. The stewardship and the planning that this board has done over time has put us in a spot where we can be very thoughtful and purposeful about how we adjust our expenditures to re, uh, relate to our new reality. Declining enrollment is a terrible thing for school districts because it is a year over year, it's the death by a thousand cuts, so to speak, in terms of that every year we lose a little bit more money. There is some declining enrollment revenue from the state, but it does not cover what you lose, not even close. And so starting with a position of financial strength is a good place to be. It allows us to be thoughtful, it allows us to be thorough, and it allows us to meter out some of these adjustments over the period of a few years. So we also wanna share that we um, have, a, have our financial oversight has been validated numerous times by our auditing firms. And most recently, once again, with Standard & Poor's validating our um, top six in the state bond rating AA+. I share this to set the stage that we are at a point where we are well-managed financially and the issue with our expenditures has to do with declining enrollment with things that are beyond our control. We take ownership of that and we have to take leadership of the district through it. So Val and I are proposing a slightly, we're going to use the work that the district has done over the last 20 years in terms of a program-based budgeting process, but we are updating it to what we call a priority-based budgeting process and a typical budget cut within a school system you just identify what you would like, what you say we're going to get rid of. And we don't think that that's worthy of us this time around. We're gonna take the new strategic plan that you just adopted. We're going to give that to three different budget teams, a team that is going to govern expenditures from our elementary schools, a team that will govern expenditures from our middle school, high school and area learning center programs, and then a district services team. And we are going to identify what are the most important things in alignment with the strategic plan that we should fund first. So rather than just saying what you wanna get rid of, you say, what are the things that are most important to be able for us to achieve the benchmarks that we have identified in the strategic plan? And so this discussion and this process could be a little bit messy to start. And we think that that's okay. Again, coming from a position of financial strength, we have the ability to take the time with these particular discussions. Um, so we have four meetings set up. Um, we have a meeting on February 20th. I've outlined those in the packet, uh, February 24th, March 1st, March 15th, March 24th. I've outlined what we're planning to do. Uh, we've been recruiting people to participate in these budget teams. We wanna have uh, budget teams that reflect the community. So we want staff members, of course, we want students from our district youth council and other interested students. We want parents, we want community members without children to be part of these systems as well. And we would really, we really seek to have these teams also reflect the demographic reality of our system as well. We'll be providing some translation for some Spanish speaking 
uh, parents to participate uh, in these teams. Uh, we've had some response. The last time I checked, we had about 22 or 24 people total that had responded. We need a few more than that. So the official application piece, or the, excuse me, the official interest form uh, closed today. And then we'll look at where we're at. And then I will then specifically recruit additional people to participate in these teams. Each team will be given a budget target. They'll be given all of the information for the budgeting areas within that team's purview. And they will start to talk about what are the most important things that that team should fund. They will do so, and then we will do the mathematics. And once they hit the budget target, the remaining items are the items that would be either put on uh, an un uh, a, uh, unrequested leave of absence, or depending on other circumstances, if we have probationary staff or other things, it could be that that uh, non-renewal of probationary staff is also used. Anytime you talk about a, any kind of budget adjustment, people will always say, well, we need to do stuff that's outside of the classroom. That is not possible in Minnesota. Because we have been un underfunded chronically, there are no schools that have a bunch of stuff remaining. You can't cut your way to this with copy paper. It just doesn't work, right? The things that um, are outside of the classroom are long gone. And in every school in Minnesota, I don't care which one you look at, 80% of their budget will be salary and benefits. You cannot make budget adjustments in public schools in Minnesota without impacting the people who work here. That's a reality. It's not intended to sound harsh. It's intended to be transparent. And so we are working through uh, what we think the number will be uh, to start. And I'll have Val talk a little bit about that if she would just want to give a little bit of a heads up as to where we're still finalizing that. But if you want to just talk about how we're getting uh, to that final number that we'll have uh, available for those committees um, starting a week from Thursday. Sure. Um, so I have been working to update our financial forecast with our updated enrollment um, after the demographic report was presented and just concerns about the inflation rates we've been seeing, um, our current staffing contracts and all of those pieces that come together and um, forecasting that basically over the next five years to see um, with the decline in revenue, where does that put that put us and how quickly. Um, and so my current um, recommendation is gonna be about four and a half million. And I do, um, I do think we have several strategies where we could um, phase it in um, so that it doesn't have to be all for next year. Um, we can use the federal funds for budget stabilization. And so that is a strategy we can use as well as a couple of different things that we've been um, talking about internally to help make sure that it's not, um, it goes as smooth as possible, I guess would be our goal. Um, so four and a half is kind of where we're landing right now, um, depending on the different financial components and how the legislature comes through or does not come through. Um, it could be the potential that two years from now, we'd be looking at maybe a little bit more. Um, but again, I think any any way in which we can stagger it and make sure that it's um, providing enough stability for the buildings and the students um, to bring us to where we need to is really the goal. So that's the current estimate. Um, but again, there's, there's several things that are at play that we won't know about until after this process is done. Um, the free lunch for students, uh, free breakfast and lunch plays a pretty significant role um, with our ability to qualify for things such as title or um, compensatory revenue. And so all of those things I have estimated, but if there are significant changes in um, whether or not we qualify for those funding streams that kind of has a trickle effect later in the budget. So that's a lot of <laughs> kind of estimates, but four and a half million is um, currently where the number is. And I think that that's the, if, for those of you who are veterans of the board and you remember the project-based budget or the program-based budgeting process, the concept of what we called restoration packages. So this does that in reverse as well. So when we go through the process, we will have identified the next most important things. And if we were to see additional funding, we would be able to add those things. 
Um, we've been really working hard on our legislative action committee. And I do think that's something that this process is helpful. When we go to St. Paul often and we talk about increased funding, we talk about it in more global kinds of terms, right? We talk about it that we can reduce class size, we can do, and with a priority-based budgeting process, when we go to our legislators, we will say, if you gave us another 2% on the formula, we can add these three teachers in this per these particular areas. So it's going to give us a much more concrete way to be able to advocate and make what those additions would be real to people when we're talking about it. So again, to our knowledge, this is not, uh, we are putting our approach to this to think about what do we, it, there's a different mindset of what do we fund versus what do we get rid of. And at the end of the day, you still have a cut. We're not trying to sugarcoat that, but we're trying to get a better way of budgeting to say we're gonna fund the things that we think have the greatest chance to help us achieve those benchmarks that we adopted as part of our strategic plan. Uh, what can board members do as part of this process? Uh, so board members are able to observe these committees. Uh, the committees will be running simultaneously. We'll post them uh, kind of like you would for a work session, right? So there's no decisions being made at them, but board members would be able to attend and, and be able to observe if they so chose. Uh, when we're done with this, we'll bring you a report uh, we will then talk about the next steps. I do envision this potentially including a public hearing where we lay this out to the community and have people be able to share their perspective with the board finalizing those decisions uh, most likely in May is really what we're looking at in terms of being able to get those processes going for any positions that might have to go on unrequested leave or um, the probationary uh, non-renewal process as well. So we wanted to share with you our vision. We've been talking with you about this for some time, right? We've It's been one of our goals for this year, I do want to point out, this is a process we had intended to do last year. And we just did not feel we could do it effectively last year in the middle of the pandemic. And I think that goes to the stewardship that the district had, that we did have enough funds and reserve to be able to take one more year so that we could really be able to engage the community in this process. So we'd be happy to answer um, any questions. I do want to emphasize, um, we have a good plan here, but this is also not something that we've seen a playbook necessarily before on. So I just, we need to ask upfront for your grace. We are able to work through this in a very professional way, but we, we do think that this discussion could be a little bit messier than what a true just cutting process would be. And we're comfortable with messy for that particular purpose. For now. Thank you so much. Board members, any questions or comments? Amy. Um, so, Superintendent Tillman, I was wondering about, um, in the past, we've had a commitment to hiring a diverse workforce, and I assume that that would still be important, but I don't quite see how it fits in with our benchmarks and our other our official commitments that we have in this plan. So, how do you see that working? Well, one of our strategic commitments is equity. And part of equity is to ensure that we have a staff that uh, reflects the student population. So I would argue that that is part of the strategic commitment of equity. And that more diverse workforce is going to help us achieve those benchmarks. So I don't think it's a benchmark, so to speak, as opposed to hiring a more, making sure that we have a more diverse candidate pool is a reflection of that core commitment to equity. And I would say it's beyond the candidate Pool, it also goes to when we're making decisions about what parts get cut and what parts don't, that that should have some weight in the decision. I mean, it shouldn't be based entirely on that, but it should be considered. Well, and equity is one of our strategic commitments. So that's a lens in which we should look this process through. But when we say equity, we just say we ensure that every child has a fair opportunity to reach their potential. So it's very general. That's how we define it. Julie. Well, thank you for putting this process together. I had a few questions. Um, when will these teams meet? Uh, yes, so in the packet we've got, they'll meet on a- I understand the dates, I'm sorry. I meant oh, time of day. I am sorry about that, my apologies. No, I wasn't clear. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Excellent, happy to hear that. I know in the past we've done 4 p.m. and I yep. like to hear that at 6 p.m., that's excellent. Um, then special education or special services would be, student services would be a part of the district committee, right? District nope. services or where would that 
fall. So that's actually um, one of the, I would say one of the two major changes that we're, we're doing with this process. So we're actually including special services in the elementary and secondary packages as they are right now. Um, they are gen ed students first. And so we wanted that comprehensive look at all of the secondary education and all of the elementary education for all of the students. It will be clearly identified which expenditures are special ed with obviously an explanation of maintenance of effort and that they're restricted, but there are avenues where we can adjust some of it, but it has to be obviously very carefully considered. Um, but we wanted to make sure that that was a comprehensive conversation rather than kind of its own untouchable. Yeah, that's um, really excellent. That's a huge improvement over the way we have done the process. So I appreciate that. And Julie, if I can just add to yes. that, um, I think the other part that's important is uh, we know that the legislature is going to be talking. Uh, there's a bill, I believe it's 3224 in the legislature that would fully fund um, the special education cross subsidy. And so one of the other reasons that we felt it was important to include special education as part of the elementary and secondary teams is for people to actually see what does that cross subsidy mean? And so that I just, tr to be very truthful, we wanted people to see the reality of the cross subsidy and how it plays out in budgeting at those levels. And I would encourage anybody watching to uh, contact the legislature and fully support 3224 that would um, really basically eliminate or pretty close to it, the special education cross sub. If we got that bill, that would take care of our budget reductions because that is what our gap is, is the special education cross subsidy. Thank you, Julie, for letting me interrupt your second question. No, no, that I, I'm so happy to hear that's how we're going to look at, at those expenditures. That's excellent. Um, my last question then would be co-curricular activities where that falls. Is that within each of the, the buildings? Yep, we are, yep, we'll match up the secondary activities and any elementary activities. Um, with those packages, because um, we didn't want it to feel um, adversarial. We wanted it to be a comprehensive part of what we're offering. Yeah, that's an excellent change as well from, from the way we have done it in the past. Okay, I have one last question. So when we talk about, um, previously it was restoration, now we're, we were able to talk about that as additional. Would we, are, is there, any thinking around the 16% fund balance? And then here's what it could look like if we went to a 14% fund balance, kind of be able to, to look at that for the board to review. Yep, um, so that is one of the strategies um, that I've considered. And I do think it could also just be a temporary strategy to phase in the expenditure reduction as well. Um, so that's one of the ones that I've been considering. I also think there's avenues to consider um, the way in which we calculate it. So maybe keeping 16%, but choosing different expenditure categories. So we know LTFM has restricted revenue and expenditures, but right now all of those expenditures are included in that calculation. So um, it's clearly the most conservative way to do it, which I appreciate, um, but there are some other avenues um, and I think that that's worthy of a discussion. So there, there's lots of different things we can consider. Um, that would certainly be a, a board decision and not a committee decision. So that would be bringing all of that data back together and presenting it to the board and saying, here's the different ways in which we could roll that out, um, if that makes excellent, sense. Excellent, excellent. I mean, clearly this is a reflection of a lot of work and, and thought that you have put around making that a, making it a really good process. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Tom. Um, <clears throat> uh, to sort of follow up on what uh, Amy was asking, if we want a diverse workforce, but yet we're gonna maybe cut the for lack of better description, lower seniority would, and um, my guess is maybe the diverse workforce tends to be because they're just new getting into this, that they may be in that lower seniority. Are there union rules or is there flexibility in, in how we can staff that? Uh, there is not. So the, the, uh, 
the rule that we have is uh, uses people who are hired most recently, basically what you do when you look at. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the area that you're looking at the reduction. You look at that area that you're looking at the reduction and you would, would look at, are there probationary teachers who are part of that uh, area to begin with? You will always look at non-renewing uh, those probationary teachers first. Then what you would look at from there is you would uh, look at uh, the lowest senior teachers in that area and our contract outlines that that is the way uh, that we would need to do that reduction in force. Okay. Then uh, one other question, are all the meetings in person? And not yes. for, uh, but- All of them are in person. Um, well, um, so I was wondering because you're, you only have 22 people and what we learned from the pandemic is that Zoom meetings um, work and they, they bring in more people that who may not otherwise be able to get, especially young families with kids that they can't leave. So I, I don't know if there's any potential for a meeting like that, just to uh, broaden it. I would say uh, right now at this point, uh, if we had a weather related issue for a meeting that we would move it to Zoom. What I will say is that this kind of work, and I'm a big believer in using Zoom meetings as well. Um, however, this kind of work is relational. It's very much about people. And so you're gonna bring people together who don't necessarily, um, that could be that some people who don't know each other you know, quite yet. And what I have learned um, in close to 20 years, that's shocking, almost 20 years of facilitating online groups. I've used some of your earliest video conferencing software well before people knew what Zoom was. And what I'll tell you my experience is this, is that those kinds of digital meetings can be incredibly effective in a variety of different ways, especially if the people who are part of it have had the community building opportunity before you move to that. Not always, I wanna say this is not always, but so I think Tom, as much as I would like to say, I, th I think you're right, we could probably get some more people. And frankly, it would even be a little simpler from the translation perspective if we did it via Zoom. But this part about looking at each other and sharing that same space when we're talking about these really important things, I think to begin with anyway, um, is where we need to be. And so I understand totally and, and, and really valid, validate what you're saying. I do think we could get some more people in that way. Um, however, I just, I don't think it would be as effective initially. Thanks. Jeff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not against Zoom meetings for, you know, for whatever reason, but, you know, as we kind of coming out of this pandemic um, and to understand that, you know, communication is about 60% nonverbal. So it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So, I mean, having people in the room and getting some good robust discussion and kind of getting back to that is, is uh, obviously a good idea, but you know, also Zoom's always an option. So, thank yeah, you. And, I, and I think we could certainly use it for weather related pieces to keep the process on track and, and some other pieces where I could see that if we did need to do some additional pieces or maybe that we wanna get some additional feedback on the process, I could see us um, augmenting it you know, with some other kinds of things. But I think this initial part, I think you just need to have people in the room and hearing that emotion you know, and be able to see people's body language directly uh, in 3D um, which is not as easy as doing um, right now on, on Zoom as well, so. Anybody else? Corey. Yeah, I have a couple questions concerning the 16% fund balance. I may be misremembering. I feel like last year when we are going through some of the budget pieces, one of the strategies, I know Val, you just said this is one of the potential strategies, but I felt like there was a strong leaning toward going to a lower number because we realized we were keeping a pretty high threshold. Is that getting more consideration as one of your strategic points here or? Is that just still up for debate? Um, I still think it's up for debate. That is that has been the board goal for a, a long time based on the situation the district went through um, that was very difficult in 05, 06, somewhere in that range. And the I will say it is higher than our peers, um, like similarly sized peers. And that again is a product of the situation that was here. But I also heard very clearly the um, recognition of what it has allowed us to do as a school district. And so I'm happy to, to walk us through that discussion. Um, I, I think there's valid points both ways and it's, it's not permanent. We can always 
go back and forth. Um, it's much more difficult to go up than to go down. I want to be very clear. <laughs> um, but that is, um, at the end of the day, the, the board's um, discretion. You alluded to my second question. Uh, when we look at our comparable districts, where do they fall? I know I'm asking you to pick a number out, but are we much more higher than them? Mm -hmm. I would say the average is between 8 and 12. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that you know we also discussed that, didn't we, during the strategic plan benchmark adoption process. And so we did adopt a benchmark of 16%. However, again, that's a benchmark that can be changed. It's something that we could look at. Julie? Yeah, I just thank Corey for bringing that forward, that discussion again, because it's I think it's a discussion that has a lot of merit and I will you know appreciate when, when we can have that. So thanks, Corey. And the final part that I just want to make on this, uh, is that some people, as we get this process going, will ask, can we find more revenue? And there isn't. I mean, we just have to be straight up about that is that we have the highest operating levy allowed by law for the longest time period allowed by law with an inflationary factor. So our community has stepped to the plate every time to make up for what the state hasn't done. And so the issue is that that's another part, I mean, we, we, and that's why I wanna be super thoughtful about the fund balance because we, we do not have any other vehicles. So we have some very limited vehicles, I should say, in which we could raise additional revenue. Um, we're doing some of that through things like the Portage Program, where we're trying to be able to recruit, or not recruit, but offer up people from outside of the community another way to open enroll. We're doing some of those, but those revenue streams aren't going to make up for the declining enrollment and the chronic underfunding. So I'm, I'm all for looking at the fund balance as well, but we just remember we can only spend each fund balance dollar once. And once it's gone, you know, then, then we could be, so we want to be very thoughtful about, we don't have any, there's nobody better to be at the helm for making that determination than Val Murder Store. So we've got a team here that we're going to be able to give you a good recommendation on, but we, I just want to urge caution when it comes to that discussion about fund balance. Um. Um, along the lines on the, the levy, so we have a levy that is coming to an end, is that right, relatively soon, and if that isn't renewed, that would uh, you know, be a big impact on us, right? Yes, the capital projects levy um, expires in 2023, which is revenue for the 2023-24 school year, so that is $750,000, um, which is significant. I do have that in the projection as falling off and not being renewed. So that that is being like, obviously that would, our hope is that it'll be renewed, but that is how I'm projecting it just so that we are very clear upfront. And again, if that's renewed and or increased, um, like Dr. Hillman said, we will have those res restoration packages where we could choose to add things back. Um, should that be the case? And we also just remind people the capital projects levy almost could almost do it does almost no uh, general fund work, right? The capital projects levy is really about the kinds of things that you heard in capital tonight, or the it's not long term. We can pay for technology services salaries out of it. So that is the that is the one way if you were to look at expanding the capital projects levy you could cover all of the technology services, staff members, salaries and benefits with a capital projects levy. So that's the only real revenue, voter approved revenue stream that we would have uh, to be able to make that. So that's, it's just to be clear that it does affect the general fund, but it doesn't necessarily talk about the positions that we're, that we're going to have to discuss, except in this very limited way but the lack of renewal would result in a general fund absorbing all of the current expenses that, is true. that it does fund. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Jeff. Yeah, Matt kind of took the, well, I didn't say take it, but he said proceed with caution. So, I mean, obviously we're moving into that period and, and we've got inflation. It's it's a hard time. And, and, and uh, you know, I think we want to be, very um, realistic about the odds of things passing and not passing, but we, at the same time, we want to be, you know, have a, a good fund balance there and not necessarily make that decision. Um, you mentioned, you know, eight to 12 is the, the uh, kind of the, the ballpark, but I mean, I give us a lot of credit that we've gone through all of this stuff and we're still, we still have 16 there. So, I mean, that, that is, 
you know, for lack of a better expression, a little bit of our pot and gold, and that's some money sitting there that we could really figure out if we get in the crunch where we need to go. So. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, Dr. Hellman, my question was about how big the groups you're hoping the groups will be, and, I, and if I heard correctly, you have 20 people signed up so far? And it, yeah, and the 20, about 24 up. signed up so far. Okay. And we're really looking for about 20 to 24 people per group. Mm -hmm. Now we could do that with less, right? But what we're trying to do is we're trying to, for example, we're looking for three administrators, six teachers, six parents, couple students, you know, so we're looking at those stakeholder groups. We could do it with fewer of each of those if we need to, but we're going, we wanted to, we, we felt we needed to wait until people had a chance to weigh in whether they had an interest. And then we will start to recruit people here this week. Mm -hmm. We have a list. And it's so significant what you said about the house bill um, on cross subsidy. If it was funded, we wouldn't even have to go through this whole process. Is that right? That is correct. <laughs> Goodness. So that's a great point of advocacy for all of us in our community, especially these committee members that you're gathering. And especially with a $7.7 .7 billion surplus. Right. Potentially 10 is what we're hearing now. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? We're good. All right, we will move on to our next item, which is um, superintendent operations um, and COVID-19 update. Yeah, I'm gonna give this a, a very brief update here today because we will talk about it a little bit more in uh, the items for individual action. Um, but I do wanna just frame how far we have come uh, in terms of uh, just the, the de decline in cases. Um, so in the packet, you see the uh, graph, which clearly shows that Omicron did exactly what the experts said it would do, significant rise, quick drop off. You'll see that um, really how things affected us in January, 332 total positive cases on January 1, 940 on January 31st, let that sink in. I mean, we had nearly three times the number of cases in one month that we had the entirety of last year. Just think about that. But the good news is that that was a quick burn, right? And so now we are on a great pathway. Um, I, I can't even believe it, but when I did the count last Thursday for this, we were at 1,024 total cases this year. And today, um, when I updated the dashboard this morning, 1,033. I cannot recall a weekend where we had that few cases in a long, long time. So the public health situation is rapidly improving. This is very good news. And the influenza-like illness rates have really returned uh, to the levels that they, they're, I'm not gonna say that they're normal, but let's just point out that in six of our seven buildings that we uh, look at uh, each week, uh, six of those seven buildings were below 2% of students out on average for influenza-like illnesses, and two buildings were below 1%. So that is really good data showing that we are going in the right direction. So uh, that is the basic part of that report this evening. Uh, give you a testing update again. We have seen the testing also be reduced at the district testing center. Uh, earlier today, I heard what we did. We are now at 1492, uh, 1,492 rapid molecular tests. Again, we have now expanded the ability for people who are asymptomatic. And we have also expanded the ability for people who live in the same household as one of our students or staff members, before we limited the Q drive through testing center uh, to symptomatic people who were students, staff, or children of our staff. Uh, what we've done is we've been able to expand that so that people have an opportunity. So it is now for people who are students, staff, children of staff, or anybody who lives in a household with um, one of our students or a member of our staff. So we've expanded that ability for people to access that. And then of course, we still have a tremendous amount of rapid antigen tests available. And then the final bright spot that I wanna to share today is I just cannot say enough about our partnership with KMYMN Radio, the one downtown Northfield. Of course, you know, uh, KYMN has always been a great uh, ally in helping us get the local news out, whether it be city news or school district news. They give us a lot of time to be able to share with the community what's going on. Um, just have been outstanding partners and most recently, uh, they have really taken the mantle on how to stream uh, Raider athletics. So they've always done radio over time, but they now have been able to, by leveraging their streaming ability on the internet, they have more than one game happening at one time. They've added some video components to it so that people at home can also see uh, some video components. 
And so we're really excited about where this is going. Some of this is still kind of the wild west because there are some rules with the state high school league, for example, around postseason activities that you're not allowed to uh, do the video streaming. So there's a lot that's happening and learning, but uh, Lance Reister and the team at KYM are just doing an excellent job of being able to make sure that um, our athletes have an opportunity to be heard and seen regardless of where you are on the planet. And so this is a, a very exciting development. We anticipate they're going to do more of that next year. So that is the operations update for this evening. Thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? Tom. Would KYMN uh, live stream our graduation? They already do. Or do they? Yep, they, they do the radio portion. Um, so they have not done a video portion yet, but I, I do think that they potentially would. Okay, great. Okay. Anyone else? And Dr. Hammond, did you wanna talk about the two grants in the consent agenda? Sure, I can do that right now. So uh, there are two, just as part of the consent agenda coming up, there are two grants. Uh, the first of which is a DHS grant. And so that's a Department of Human Services grant for childcare centers to help offset some of the lost revenue and other costs associated with COVID. That's a, I believe Director Murderstorff, that's a, about a $76,000 grant is what I think that I saw in there. So that is something that all childcare centers in the state, as long as they meet certain criteria have access to. So we're making application for that. Uh, the other one is, is a very exciting um, MTSS grant. And so this is multi-tiered systems of support. We love our acronyms, multi-tiered systems of support. And this would take what we have already been doing with MTSS and go further really around coordination and training. So the grant would pay for a half-time MTSS coordinator within the instructional services department. It would uh, cover substitute teacher costs uh, to provide training during the school day for licensed staff so they could oversee math and literacy interventions. It would do training outside of the contract day for educational assistance so that they can become more proficient in delivering uh, math and literacy interventions teachers participating in summer work teams so that we're aligning instructional practices. This is a high impact uh, approach that we've learned the summer work team piece. This is, would be specific to science, the science of reading and math. Um, we've talked with you before about letters. So it would also uh, pay for some letters facilitation training. Um, it would also do some contracted services for a data integration specialist to be able to help automate some of the non-academic and classroom level student data so that we can get that into our data and uh, analytics system. Uh, we do some contracted services for social emotional uh, learning intervention training. Um, there's a, uh, uh, a really interesting tool we're trying called Close Gap. It's a student emotional uh, check-in and tracking tool. So it's almost like the old um, local collaborative time studies where students can some students who participate get a randomized, how are you feeling now? And they answer a handful of questions and then this gives us a better data set to take a look at how are our students doing socially and emotionally. So we've, we've done some piloting with that. It's very exciting. Um, and then it would also, very rarely can you do this, but would also pay for some meals for family engagement and input sessions, as well as parent participation on an MTSS district leadership team. So it's a $250,000 competitive grant. And so we will see where it lands, but it's part of the consent agenda as just how we, um, that's how we do grant applications. Fantastic. That's a lot <laughs> under one grant. No kidding. And how, what is, I don't know if Julie, you're going to ask this question too. Um, the timeline on it, how many years or school years does it cover? Yeah, I think it's, a, if I'm right, it's a four-year grant, I believe. Is that correct, Val? Do you remember? That's okay. Thank you. Julie, would you like to? No, I just really appreciate um, the opportunity to hear more about these two grant opportunities. And I just really applaud the district for always being tenacious about pursuing these all of these opportunities because this is significant revenue and the financial hardship um, just roughly around seventy six thousand um, dollars that money would go into the um, community education um, child care budget line correct it because as I read it first I was thinking it was for families but it's really for to stabilize our budget yeah, Excellent. yep, it is okay. to stabilize the, the kid ventures and early ventures budget. It, we had to apply by site. Um, so it would be um, divvied up based on those allocations. And the MTSS grant is for fiscal year 22 and 23 is what the application says. Um, not really sure how it's for fiscal 22. Um, so my guess would be two years starting July 1. Okay. 
Thanks, Al. So we have a, such a strong re track record of getting competitive grants, so we will hope that's the case. Um, Val, how competitive is the financial hardship grant, or do you perceive that pretty optimistic about getting that slightly less than eighty thousand um, dollars? I think we have pretty good um, odds on that one. There, they have it um, scheduled where you can apply every three months, so I think there's enough funding. Um, I think they're anticipating it will all get spent this first round, but um, my my sense is we would have a pretty good chance of getting the vast majority of it, if not all of it. Excellent, thank you. Yep. All right, anyone have questions or comments? Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to consent agenda. We will now move on to approve to approval of the consent grouping. As a reminder, there are some personnel items um, from the table file as well as an um, item for individual action. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping for separate consideration? Is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Okay, moved by Corey, second by Tom. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, items for individual action. Our first item is approving the revised 2022-2023 school year calendar. Is there a motion to approve the revised school year calendar for 2022-2023? Moved by Julie, second by Tom. Oh, thank you. Okay, Dr. Helmut, would you like to make any comments? Um, I think that uh, if people have any questions about the calendar, we've this is the second time that they've seen it, so we could certainly answer any of those. Mm -hmm. Any discussion, questions, comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And we have a revised calendar for this school year. For the next school year, 22, 23. Sorry, 20, yep. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, we have four policies next, and this is the second read of those policies. Um, so they are grouped, and I'm going to call for a motion um, to um, approve all four policies. Okay, moved by Corey, second. Okay, thank you, Tom. Is there any discussion on any of the policies or any questions? Any comments? I just do want to point out in the, um, we did make one change about the school meals piece that based on the board talking about just making sure that we're keeping confidential. So we changed it from the word minimize mm -hmm. of focusing on um, students who with insufficient funds to keep confidential. So that was the work that we did with child nutrition to uh, accommodate what the board had said the last time. Thank you. I don't see any more um, discussion, so we're going to move on to vote on all of the policies. All those in favor of policy, all those in favor of policy four, 503, 515, 524.2, and 534, um, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. All four policies pass. Okay, next we have a resolution. A resolution approving the purchase agreement and authorizing sale of property. The board had previously approved an option agreement with Rebound Real Estate by which a small parcel of school district property would be sold to Rebound if it exercised the option to acquire the policy. And Rebound has exercised that option to purchase the property on terms and conditions set forth in the purchase agreement attached. This is a resolution with a roll call vote. Is there a motion approving the resolution approving purchase agreement and authorizing sale of property? Moved by Jeff, second by Julie. Okay. Dr. Hillman or Val, do you have any comments? I'll have Val just talk a little bit about why we had to bring this back to you for a second time. Yep, so we, um... Based on the approval of the option agreement, um, had worked with Rebound and signed the purchase agreement before December 31st. The attorney that they work for or work with um, has some very specific requirements in the statute that we 
um, we had actually talked with our lawyer um, or our attorney and he felt comfortable with um, the process we had gone through, but um, their attorney really wanted the additional um, very specific board action on with the resolution roll call vote. So that's why we're bringing it back. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any comments or questions, Tom? I'm oh, sorry. Okay, Amy. Uh, I just want to just double check that we're just reapproving the same thing we approved before. So it's pretty much all the same. Okay, thank you. Good thank question. You. Okay, Tom. And I'm going to abstain again, like I did the first time around, because my son, while he was in uh, school, worked for um, Rebound Enterprises and still has a connection with them. And I don't want any, uh, any misgivings. Sure. Appreciate that, Tom. Any other comments or questions? Corey. So like last year, I'm going to be a no on this vote. Um, I have some real concerns with the development. I found out recently that they have now eliminated the three-bedroom apartments, which was a big draw. We're moving forward because it's a place for families to grow. We just had Hazel Reinhardt here three weeks ago with an enrollment update and projection for us, and it looks bleak. And as we know, apartments produce on average 0.11 children per unit, which is about, I believe, one sixth of a single family home. Uh, we do have a housing issue. We need to have more homes. I don't know if this project is the correct project. It's not for me to say. I know the council tomorrow will be voting on it and we'll see what happens there, but just to remain consistent with where I was last year, I am still a no. Thank you. Appreciate that. No. Well, pull, it, pull your mic down there, please. I, I live near that, the questionable piece of property. And I think I can explain a couple of things. It is a wedge-shaped piece of property that's probably 100 feet on one side of the block. It's a block wide. And it probably goes to a wedge on the other side. And the advantage, how about this? The, the advantage of letting the property, selling the property, yeah, I think it's twofold. One, it's a, a nuisance for the school to have to maintain that property. And secondly, it allows the development to put a sidewalk across the south side of Lincoln Parkway where they probably wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. So it gives the residents of that new development an opportunity to be able to walk to the school. There will be crosswalks across Lincoln Parkway. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the sidewalks will have exits to match up with the crosswalks on Lincoln Parkway. So there is a safety attitude that I, I think is really important and is why I'm supporting it. Thank you, Noel. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second and no further discussion. Anita will now facilitate a roll call vote. Baraniak. Abstain. Butler. No. Gerwitz. Aye. Gonzalez. George. Aye. Pritchard. Aye. Quinnell. Aye. Stratmoen. Okay, thank you. Resolution passes. Okay, our final item for individual action is the approval of changes to COVID-19 protocols. So we'll take a motion and then we'll have discussion. Is there a motion to update our COVID-19 protocols? Okay, moved by Jeff, second by Julie. Okay, Dr. Hillman, will you share on this item? Yes, so um, from the beginning of the pandemic, we have continued to use uh, the best information that we have at the time to make decisions. Um, this year, uh, as a, unlike last year, school districts, all 332 school districts across Minnesota were forced to determine their own pathway forward without any statewide requirement or guidance. And so the Northfield School District did what it had done always. We used the best information that we had at the time. We talked to experts in the field. Um, and we made the best decisions that we could at the time for the public health and for the health of our students. Let's go back to August 9th and think about what is different today versus then. August 9th, we were hearing about the Delta variant that was starting to uh, become an issue. That was something that was an unknown. 
Uh, we knew that it was much more lethal than previous variants of COVID-19. That was one factor that we took into account. Another factor that we took into account was the fact that students ages five through 11 had not yet been able to be vaccinated. And we remembered very clearly the disruptions that shifts to distance learning had on our community. So we adopted a universal masking approach. We adopted other safety protocols, contact tracing, quarantining for students who had been in close contacts to uh, students who with COVID who had been diagnosed or diagnosed with COVID-19 because we wanted to prioritize uninterrupted in-person learning. And I'm very proud to say that we have withstood uh, the Omicron variant thanks to the hard work of our staff in an incredibly difficult scenario that we made it through that push in January. But the public health situation is improving. It's rapidly improving. As I shared with you just a few moments ago, our dashboard, which had gotten up over well, well over 300 active cases over a 14 day period in January has now dropped back to 55 total, only nine since last Thursday. As we talk with people in our community who we have always talked with, our epidemiologist, talking with other medical professionals within the community, our incident command team that is representative of stakeholders from within the district uh, and the community. As we're looking at the pathway ahead, uh, we believe that we are able to do what we had always said we would do, that we would go ahead and remove our protocols when we felt we were in a position where we could safely do so without jeopardizing our commitment to uninterrupted in-person learning. And what we do know is that our approaches did work and they did help us maintain that over time. But we also know that now appears to be the time where we can do this safely and without jeopardizing that goal of uninterrupted in-person learning. I do think we need to acknowledge the toll that having to implement these kinds of protocols have taken on our community. We've heard about this from people at public comment. We've heard about it in our conversations with our staff who have been tasked with making sure that these things were implemented and followed through. People have not always been kind. They've not always been kind to our school nurses who are just doing their job in terms of making sure that our environment was as safe as practicable and that students who needed medical attention or to get a test did so. Um, our teachers worked very hard to build relationships with students so that they would also uh, follow the uh, safety protocols. This is difficult for everyone. It has been incredibly challenging and we are pleased that we are able to safely move and transition to this new phase of managing the pandemic. The pandemic is not over. There's a technical epidemiological term for when the pandemic will end, but we have shifted into a different phase where we believe for the foreseeable future, we will be able to, be able to manage this differently. And I think it's important to take stock of where we have been, right? So we know that in Rice County, there's been 167 deaths. We've heard over 900,000 uh, world or uh, nationwide. So our progress has not come without pain and people have experienced that pain in a variety of different ways, but we also need to heal. And as a school district, we have the power of convening. And over the course of the next several months, I will utilize the school district's convening power to help try to move our community forward and to heal the wounds that people have had for a variety of different reasons, whether they lost someone to COVID-19, whether they uh, are experiencing some real um, anxiety as a result of the lingering pandemic, whether people were for or against a certain set of protocols, we need to move forward together. Um, and I think it's important that the school district use its convening power uh, to do just that. So with that frame of what we have lost and what we have to gain and the things that we have learned, um, I, am, I am satisfied that we are able to make this recommendation to you this evening. I'm gonna briefly cover the recommendation. The recommendation would modify some, but not all of the COVID-19 safety protocols. It would, it would actually modify most of them. The most, uh, I think the one that we all, everyone is, is interested in is the face covering. So we'd be moving face coverings from recommended, or excuse me, from required to recommended, but optional inside a Northfield school district facility, except for the Northfield Community Ed Center. Our youngest learners ages uh, zero to five are not yet eligible for vaccination. We are looking at some changes to protocols within that building. We just worked with some pediatricians last Friday afternoon to look at quarantine lengths. Um, but at this time, we're going to recommend that the NCEC protocol stay exactly the same. So that is where it's at. 
Um, again, everyone to an older would have to wear a face covering inside the Northfield Community Ed Center. So the face covering procedures that we adopted, we didn't adopt them as a policy, if you recall. They're procedures that the administration can, can make modifications to, which would be done based upon our adopting of these protocols. And so those would still cover the NCEC. Um, and then the other part we just need to make sure that people understand is that the Transportation Security Administration is in charge of all over the road transportation. And the TSA still requires all people ages two and older to wear a face covering while riding on a school bus. And so for school districts that have not used um, or have had very limited safety protocols, even their students this year were required uh, to wear a face mask on a school bus. So that's a TSA piece. We do hear that that could be coming in to an end in the next couple of weeks. So it's very possible that uh, that could end as well. Our physical distancing will remain the same as it has been. Cleaning and hygiene remains as it has been. I want to point out a couple of things in the, how we would handle uh, students with influenza or COVID-like symptoms. And I want you're going to start to hear that more and more. We're going to be talking about influenza and COVID-like symptoms. COVID-19 is not the flu, but it, has, it manifests itself similarly in some ways to the flu. And so you're going to hear us start talking about influenza and COVID-like uh, rates. And you'll see that there are three bullet points in there that we will still ask people to self-report if their student has symptoms or if they've been close contact. We still think that that's important for us to know. Um, students with influenza-like or COVID-19-like illness symptoms must stay home. If you are sick, stay home. And to come back, you'll need to come back with a negative COVID-19 test. So this is now re uh, readily available. So if I have those kinds of symptoms that could be consistent with COVID, I need to stay home. I can come back with a negative COVID test and my symptoms improving or resolving, if that makes sense. So again, that's a safety factor to make sure that we can mitigate um, people who are positive for COVID-19 coming back into the school environment. So that's again, symptomatic. People who are sick should stay home. And if you've got symptoms that are in conjunction with what COVID-19 would be, get a test. We've got all sorts of tests for you. And then we will welcome you back once you've got a negative test and your symptoms are improving. Um, and then we also want to point out that um, the district uh, COVID-19 coordinator will continue to report cases of COVID-19 to MDH. It's important that people understand we're not just saying, well, we're declaring this is over. That's not what we're doing. We're saying that we're able to safely modify some of our protocols at this time. It's also important you'll look at the section on isolation and quarantine. And this is remaining the same. So isolation is still required for anyone who has tested positive for COVID-19. So they must stay home until all of those five options or those five items are true, and they can return with a negative rapid antigen test on day five or later. They can test as if they test on day five and they're still positive, they can test again on day six. If they want to wait till day seven and test, they can do so. The maximum amount of isolation time is 10 days at this point. So handling a positive case of COVID-19 is no different than how we've handled it in the last few weeks. We have reduced quarantine excuse me, we've reduced isolation times to align with uh, MDH and CDC protocols. Um, so that's that five day piece again with a negative test coming back on day five or later. Again, we emphasize again, it's so important we put it in the isolation and quarantine area too about students who have influenza like or COVID-19 symptoms stay home. We're then saying this is important as well, COVID quarantine is not required for K-12 students or staff who've been in close contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19, we had virtually eliminated quarantine through the test to stay program, virtually eliminated it. Um, however, we're, we are eliminating it at this point with the exception of the NCEC. So the NCEC will still use quarantine uh, for close contacts. Again, we are doing everything we can to keep that child care center open. And so maintain those protocols, at least for right now, are an important strategy for us to do that. And then our visitor and volunteer pieces, are remaining the same. Um, so those are the protocol updates. I'd be happy to take any questions that people have at this time. Thank you. Any questions, Jeff? Uh, just curious on the volunteers. Um, why, why isn't the volunteer policy uh, the same as employees and um, students? Yeah, Jeff, great question. So from the beginning, when we first adopted that volunteer policy, that volunteer part of this is that we love our volunteers and we wanted our volunteers to come back. There are still many districts that aren't allowing volunteers to come back quite yet, right? And so we wanted volunteers to be able to come back. And what we do want is to be able to make sure that we're surrounding our students who 
so now, now many of whom have had a chance to be vaccinated, but we want to we want to limit the interaction with with either people from people outside of the school um, who are not vaccinated. And so that is our goal. It's, we're going to keep it that way for right now. But the logic is again, the staff have to be there, right? The students have to be there. The volunteers do not. We love the volunteers. We want them there, but we're trying to again to make sure that we can prioritize uninterrupted in-person learning. So maintain that volunteer component for right now is an important part of our strategy. Do you have a time frame when you might reconsider that? No, yeah. not yet. All right, well, that's a good answer, thanks. Good. More comment, question, Amy? So in general, I support the idea of changing the from a requirement to recommended, but I think it's also important as we do this, if we end up voting that way, that we promote a culture of choice and make it choice actually be something that's allowed and, and try to minimize peer pressure for the students who, for whatever reason, still choose to wear a mask. Um, and I also think it's important to not turn the teachers into the mask police. Um, so a lot of the families will have to work with their students and explain why they feel strongly about wearing a mask. And I'm, I think that's great. But the teachers, though, they're not mask police. They also have to create an uh, acceptance of, of the fact that people can wear masks. I think they will. I'm just throwing that out there. And I think um, after seeing so many letters from high school students that we received, it gave me hope that they would also be very much open to promoting a culture of choice and that choice is allowed. And, and you're not, you don't have to not wear a mask to get rid of that peer pressure. So um, that would be my hope. Um, one question I have is, I, um, Will people get notified if someone in their kid's classroom has COVID without doing contact tracing? Yep. But just the fact someone in the classroom came down with COVID, you should know. Yeah. So I think that I, I do want to clarify that too. In my message to families on Friday, I, I, the power of language, right? So I use the word should um, that, that, that we, we were, or I, excuse me, I'm sorry. We had said we were not going to do the general notifications anymore. And we were talking about general notifications. That was a whole nother layer of how we had set up that notification. How we envision this changing is that notifying people in an elementary classroom um, would really be more like they would get a notification for strep or influenza. So uh, some kind of communication. And we're actually looking at, we're considering, we're, we're looking at using talking points for those kinds of notifications um, as we move ahead. So. Uh, Amy, we would be still notifying families in those elementary classrooms. That becomes much more difficult at the secondary level. We typically have not notified people at the middle school or high school of a classroom that had influenza. Um, but what we will do is we'll be maintaining our dashboard. So we'll put the actual number of cases out there. And we will also be able to have the influenza-like illness rates still posted on the dashboard each week. So that will help people um, make that choice. I think the other thing that we can encourage for our middle school and high school families is because we do have access to rapid tests, we can also encourage for people who have a concern if they would like to test regularly, they certainly would be able to do so. Would it be possible to even make a finer tooth uh, uh, of uh, reporting by like in the middle school reporting by the wings of the school or, or reporting by the yeah. grades somehow, or is that too fine? So the problem with reporting by the wings is not everybody stays in the same wing, right? So there's people who move through the day. Um, I think that at this point, we would not want to go to that level of detail um, at the middle school and high school. It could quickly become unwieldy in that way. And that is one of the things that we're trying to avoid moving forward. Is it something where the teachers could kind of, I guess that, that would probably violate HIPAA, but... <laughs> There'd be a lot of problems of having teachers talk about that with their well, classrooms. Oh, yeah. so someone's not here today. I won't tell you why. I, I don't know. But um, it just seems that I, I could see why parents would be very interested in having that information and, and knowing if their child might have been exposed. And, and we'll continue to ideate ways that we could potentially report that effectively. Um, we can look at, especially with reduced cases, it's possible we could look at some of those things. 
Um, so that's something we can certainly take on. That's not necessarily a protocol based piece. That's our reporting component, right? Those general notifications and how we contact trace weren't necessarily part of the protocols in terms of how we administrated it. So I look at what you're talking about as more of an administrative component, which we can certainly look at ways to continuously improve notifying folks. Okay. Then my last question is about the NCEC. And just, I understand why um, you're recommending that we continue them the way they are now. And I get that. But I'm wondering if you have any future vision of when we would relook at this policy. Um, because while I understand it's still very important for the younger children, um, there it's also harder for them to wear masks. So. Yeah, so I think there's two things, Amy. I think um, one of which goes back to what I said about one of the rationale that we're able to remove the protocols across the rest of the district right now. Vaccination has been widely available for people uh, ages five and older for some time. Um, we had Omicron in January, which is what delayed our ability to have this discussion. But we know that vaccination is not yet available for those under five. And we know that we wanna be able to provide one, one way that we could bring forward a, a protocol change is when that vaccination for children under five becomes available. Um, we did think that there was uh, going to be a move where that was going to become available this week. We understand some of the vaccine was actually shipped uh, to locations where they would have been able to provide that, but we now see that the FDA has pushed that back until it looks like early April. So the next round of discussion that we will also have uh, is what is the appropriate for those child care settings, which are different than K-12 settings. When we look at those child care settings, what, what is the metric or the level of uh, viral activity in the community where our local pediatricians would say, yes, there's a comfort level that you'd limit uh, any kind of spread within the building. And we're still seeing some higher numbers uh, per uh, person at the NCEC versus other buildings. And so that's an area because there it's not just about the students, right? The DHS, that, most of that building is governed by the Department of Human Services. And the ratio factors for those child care centers are significant and they don't mess around. We just had a Kid Ventures a DHS site visit, which we passed with flying colors. But believe it or not, we were cited for not listing, not a, an allergy, but a sensitivity to avocados on one child's fact sheet. It was listed in another place, but we didn't list that they had a sensitivity to avocados. And so we got a ding for that. I share that example just to share how tough the DHS stuff is. And so, and they have uh, the ability to shut those kinds of programs down. We've read all the stories about how important it is to keep childcare open. So one would be, is the vaccination available for children ages six months to five? And then the second one would be if we are able to identify um, a low level of viral transmission that we think could keep that center open with confidence. Thank you. And I just have one last comment, and that is three weeks ago when we were here, we were at the height of Omicron, and it really is amazing the difference uh, with the numbers three weeks ago and now. So and where they're going. I think that that's the most important thing for people to understand. Um, we are not making these decisions based solely upon what we're seeing right now, but we're basing it based upon where the trajectory is going and what uh, the, our epidemiologists and other medical professionals are seeing that's coming down the pike. So um, as we've said, uh, the other part I wanna share is that we would consider reactivating these protocols if we were to see 5% influenza or COVID-like illness rate in any one building over a week, it's not an automatic but we would look at it then and do a little bit of a deeper dive and we might in implement something like masking for a period of a couple of weeks to make sure we could keep school going, but making sure that um, we are able to interrupt viral transmission. Or if we see a rapid decline in public health circumstances, we of course would make the decision uh, to be able to protect our community again. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. I want to express my appreciation to the leadership of the district. I think they've done an exemplary job. And I'm speaking of you know, Dr. Gilman, but also principals and the teachers, the custodians, coaches, bus drivers, volunteers. Um, I think Dr. Hillman is told to walk a very, very tight rope on this issue. And he's done so excellent, has provided the leadership to the district to be able to follow 
in, in walking that type road also. So I express my appreciation to the leadership for the district. And we can't talk about this without talking about Cheryl Hall, who has done an amazing job as our COVID-19 coordinator. So we, on top of her regular job, mind you. Thank you for the update. Thank you, Staggering. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I'm gonna call on Julie. Okay. Okay, I'll go. You actually had your hand up first. <laughs> um, so I wanna sort of echo some of the things Amy said um, and acknowledge the high school students who contacted us, all of whom were in favor of maintaining masking. And they're the ones who have to you know they're the ones in the school and they have to live with it and um and many of them had uh they all had um excellent uh reasons for um why they wanted to maintain why they wanted to maintain masking and i also wanted to um make sure like like amy said that there is no bullying there is no peer pressure there is no I mean, it's in the student handbook and everything, how people are supposed to react, but um, it, it doesn't always work that way. So I think the uh, everybody has to be on board with that. Uh, and so I have a couple of questions. Um, so were all the medical professionals that you talked to on board with this decision, Dr. Ellman? So the, the folks who I talked to, um, I would say supported the direction um, I think some had a little more trepidation than others, or at least understood the direction. Okay. Um, some people were wondering why uh, starting it next week. Some were wondering why not today. Some um, later, maybe after spring break. Is there any consideration to perhaps the, the week following spring break have masks required just for that week? Yeah, Tom, I think that once we take this off and we use the ILI rate, right, that's what we're going to use, right? What we do not want to do is one of the things that we have been successful with is consistency, right? And so I, when it comes, and you're, you're right, I would say that I think that's important for the public to know. I think we all, unfortunately, in this time frame, we are able to talk with people who generally agree with us, right? Just the, the way it is right now. It's just the way things have manifested. But what I'll tell you is for every person who we've had talk with us about waiting several weeks or to the, we have a range of people asking us to wait until the end of the school year um, to people who tomorrow is not soon enough. And so we have that range and we look at all of those things and we say, what is reasonable? You all know I subscribe to the reasonable person theory. I do not think that if, if we're going to make this decision based upon the public health data that we're seeing, um, the, I do think it's fair to have a time frame from when the from when it has been announced to when it is implemented, because this is a major change for people. And psychologically, for a number of people, this is going to be a hard change. And I think that we owe it to our friends and neighbors to give them a chance to be able to adjust to the mind, have their mindset adjust to what it's going to be like um, when they go into an environment where it's not fully masked after having been in a fully masked environment for a couple of years. Now then a reasonable person can disagree on what is that appropriate time frame. What I'll tell you is that once we make the decision, getting some feedback from my secondary administrators, is that to be able to keep this enforced from the time that we say it's going to happen until the time that it does, a week is probably about what we can do, right? To be able to get people to continue to comply. And I think frankly, that might even be a little bit of a stretch, but we know that our high school students can, and our middle school students will see the end coming. And we, I have great um, confidence that they'll continue to comply. So two weeks, three weeks out, worrying about spring break, all of those things are valid, right? The recommendation for one week is because we want to give people a reasonable time to adjust to a different way of coming to school and thinking and be able to handle that. And then, Tom, I do have to share your concerns about spring break. And one of the interventions that we'll be able to do is to really ask people and provide people with free testing so that when... When they go away, they can, when over winter break, we had people pick up over 1,600 rapid antigen tests. I have no reason to believe that they wouldn't do the same for spring break. And so I think that that's an important component is that um, we do have that testing, which we have not had available really on mass before the last couple of months. So I think that that's the yin and the yang of coming back from spring break. And so 
um, I think that as long people understand, right, that the five percent ILI rate is what's going to would potentially have us kick it back in. And so what I, we just need to ask people is you need to help us out, right? We've all said we're all in this together. We're all say we're moving forward together. And so if I'm going to go somewhere else for spring break, when I come back, before I go back to school, um, we'd encourage, I'll encourage everybody to test before they come back. I can't make everybody test, but I think if we're really talking about having choice and being responsible for one another, I think the reasonable person says that's a responsible thing to do to make sure we can keep going with minimal safety protocols. Um. Okay, thanks. And uh, if, if things go south fast, can we react quickly or do we have to wait for the 5% ILI or are there other things that, you know, if all of a sudden we have 100 cases, do we go on that and can we respond quickly like the next day require masking or is, is does that require the board's action again or how would that go? No, I mean, as a, in August, you took an action that allowed me uh, to make interim decisions based upon the public health circumstances. And um, I have st stood behind every one of those decisions that I have made. Um, they were made with the best interests of public health and of our students in mind if we've had to make an interim decision. And uh, we stand ready with our team to be able to do that with me being the person that has to make the final call. We would, of course, talk with public health. We would talk with our epidemiologists. We would talk with the other medical professionals uh, in the community we would not take that decision lightly, right? That would be a very, I mean, there's gonna be, there will be some times where there's a little bit of pressure. Think back to when we brought our middle school and high school students back in person full, fully in person to start the fourth quarter of last year. If you recall, there was a little bit of a blip and understandably so people got nervous and we held the course, right? Because we had good information and we knew that we could make it through it. I think if there's, I, I do think that I hope that we have earned uh, the trust of the community that we do use that data, whether you agree with our decisions or not, right? We use the, 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 uh, the, the data and we have been decisive. And so should that condition happen, Tom, um, we'll, we'll use our expert judgment to be able to make that call. Okay, uh, and then one last question. Do you know what the ILI typically is in January, February, like pre-COVID? So I think it'll be different year to year because remember the flu is different year to year. Right. So what I would say is that it is right now in January, it was different than normal because in the old days, if you hit 5%, they would ask you to close the building for a few days. Right. And we hit 10% in some buildings for a period of time. Uh, and they said, Nope, keep going because this is different. Right. As we keep adjusting to this, right. The 5% is a, a catalyst for discussion about what do we have here? So I, I don't have the data in front of me, Tom, but my, what I would suggest is that what we're seeing right now is actually a little bit lower than what I would say would be a normal February. Yeah. But that is uh, totally anecdotal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Julie. So I have a couple questions and a comment. Um, the NCEC, will they they will continue to be able to do a test to stay program? So uh, we are working on that. So the problem with the NCEC and test to stay, we have not implemented test to stay at the NCEC like, yet thanks for, for a that correction. couple of different reasons. Uh, we did just meet with two local pediatricians and our epidemiologist on Friday uh, to talk through, uh, is there a version of test to stay that we might be able to do for the CDC does not recommend test to stay for children under five. Okay. Um, but we are working to see if there's some kind of version of that that we could work through. And so we're just, we're still processing that information that we uh, talked with them about on Friday. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, my other question then is if, if I'm a parent and I call my student in um, to be absent and, and you have to provide a, a reason of symptoms, et cetera. What is the follow through then by the either school nurse or school administrator or someone at the building level to say, you do need to have this test before you can come back? How will that flow of communication work? So that would happen just like it's been happening for the last two years, right? So that same kind of conversation would take place just as it has up until now. Excellent, thank you. And then my last question is, I, I know you touched on it, but I wanted you to, to maybe further expound on where we were in terms of looking at immunity rate and case rate to now where we are. If someone 
you know, today the Rice County case rate, I believe was around 570 for per 100,000, which isn't anywhere within the metrics that we had originally looked at. So just wanted you to articulate um, further about how the Omicron has changed that and, and how that's really um, um, helped to advise this new exit protocol strategy. Yes, great question. Thanks for giving me the chance to uh, refocus on that. So case rates, as we talk with uh, experts in the field, are becoming more and more difficult to use as, and they're going to become more and more difficult to use as a, a, a metric that can help us make the best decisions. Um, part of that is that with the advent of the rapid tests, uh, there are more and more positive cases that are just not reported, right? So there's some underreporting. The other part that we have in our own community is that for much of the pandemic, Northfield was not too terribly far off of what Rice County, we were fairly representative of what Rice County's numbers were. Not perfect, right? But we were fairly representative. As we've been looking at the difference over the past, say, month, the difference between the Rice County number and the local Northfield Dundas number has been striking. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Some of the congregate living centers that uh, we have in other cities within the county, uh, when they experience outbreaks that can uh, artificially raise that number, you know, or it doesn't, it raises the number in the county, but doesn't necessarily reflect Northfield. So when we were taking a look at how the, the numbers that we had used with the original exit strategy were really based upon Delta, right, which was a little bit lower rate of transmission, um, but of course it was more potent. And Omicron really did turn that on its head. So as we started to work through what would, what would we raise the number of cases to where, to where we think we could feel that we could exit, um, we really struggled to be able to find a, a number that we could align with any kind of other um, research because again, everything was so new. So we, we did look at going back to the ILI rate because case, num case rates across the uh, county are just becoming more difficult to use as a decision uh, metric locally. We also did look at the, the immunity rate is an interesting uh, part as well. So when I calculated the, I, I, in previous meetings I had shared with you, I thought that the immunity rate, which just to remind people was the um, percentage of students who had had both uh, doses of the vaccine plus the students who had had COVID-19 COVID in the last 90 days, I had estimated we might be around that 74% range. Um, and when we went to do the complete dive, we were really at about 69 point, well, not about, we were at 69.26%. Um, we do have a fairly decent number of students who got the first dose, but did not get a second dose. And so our definition of the immunity rate was both doses of the vaccine. Um, and so we look at our, the immunity rate throughout the whole district, I want to point out. Now, when you look at Northfield High School, for example, where we've had some feedback from the student population, Northfield High School is in outstanding shape from an immunity rate perspective, 88%. So that's eight, that 88% reflects the number of students at that school who have had both doses of the vaccine plus the students who have tested positive for COVID-19 in the last 90 days. So when we think about the students that we heard from, and again, I applaud uh, their engagement in the public process and really have tremendous respect for it. Um, Northfield High School is nearly as good as it's going to get you know, in terms of an immunity rate. And so that population is, is, is really well protected overall. So if I could just make a comment, like if I could just make a quick comment. Um, so, so as I was thinking about the proposal tonight and and the opportunity that you know we we have to to vote on this, um, I was thinking about from the onset of the pandemic that how as a board we have been resolute in prioritizing the health and safety of our staff and students. Um, you know, we find ourselves now well into the third year of managing the challenges of the pandemic, yet we've never wavered from this commitment. You know, and I, as, as uh, Dr. Hillman um, described the process that has, has led to the initiation of the protocols and where we're now at now, you know, in, in August, we did demonstrate this commitment and we took board action to require masks in all district buildings. You know, at that time, with the emergence of the Delta variant, that was an easy decision for me. When the Omicron variant arrived, it was critically important to keep this requirement in place. Um, when we put these safety protocols in place, the board acknowledged we would continue to monitor the, monitor the progression of COVID-19 and adjust these protocols accordingly. 
With the Omicron surge behind us, I believe we're at a point in the pandemic where we can adapt our protocols. The data and other key factors that support that this move at this juncture is that we can do that safely. We can do this safely. And the conditions are rapidly improving. Um, the exit strategy um, reflects an ongoing commitment to prioritizing the health and safety of our school community. The district will continue to closely monitor our school's influenza-like illness rates. There is an availability of high quality masks and readily accessible testing. In August, when we implemented the protocols, I knew that ultimately the decision to adjust them would be difficult. So here we are. Um, I'm grateful for all the emails the board received and for tonight's public comment. Um, the excuse me, perspectives that were shared were ones I fully considered as part of my decision-making process. We can't make this decision without acknowledging Dr. Hillman's leadership and the incredible work that he has done to get us to this place and the um, care and, and the con consulting of so many experts and different district stakeholders that, that developed this, this exit strategy. And if this proposal does pass tonight, I know the district does stand ready to reactivate our safety protocols if our current situ situation dramatically changes. I hope that that will provide reassurance to those who have concerns about this proposal. I also wanna thank both Amy and Tom for reiterating um, the optional masking that this protocol puts in place and really truly hopeful that our school commun community will respect those who will make the decision to continue to wear a mask. I, will, I applaud them for making the decision that is right for them. So I do plan to support this proposal. Um, again, we, we stand ready to reactivate if, if the situation changes, but we are at a juncture where I think we can do this safely. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Terrific comment. Tom, did you want to share again? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Dr. Hillman, you said it's 88% in the high school of two shots and or having had COVID. What about the booster? Any data yeah, I did not calculate the booster at the high school. I, th there, we do have students who do have the booster. Um, what we do, what the what we still define as fully vaccinated is the two doses. We do have students who have the, but I did not calculate the booster as part of that. I can, I just didn't do it as of now. Uh, well, it's just that they're uh, saying that the the two shots are are good, but the booster is the best. And yeah, and, and I, so. I can tell you that I in in um, I believe there's quite a few students who have received a booster, but I don't have the data in front of me. Great. Thanks. Anyone else, Corey? Lots of good questions tonight. Most of my questions were answered. I do have one more concerning transportation. Um, I'm curious what conversations you had over the weekend with Benjamin Bus. Obviously, that's something they've been enforcing all school year anyhow, but similar to the schools themselves, enforcing this when students are you know, experiencing something else up to the bus and as soon as they get off the bus is going to be a different animal, uh, not only for day-to-day -day transportation, but also for activities. What, what are the conversations you've been having? So I talked with John Benjamin um, prior to the announcement and we talked through, uh, they will continue to be able to enforce this to the best of their ability. Uh, remember that one of the challenges for bus drivers is that their primary objective is the safe transportation of the students. So there are times where there is non-compliance on the bus. What I can tell you is that when we have known that and we have shared it with Benjamin Bus, they have been swift to be able to try to intervene this school year. So we anticipate, John was very straight up that it becomes much more difficult to enforce this on the bus when it's not something that's at school. Uh, he and his team are aware of that. Um, I, I don't have any reason, but, but we've also heard that, uh, I believe that that TSA rule expires in March. Uh, and so we've heard some pieces that uh, it may be allowed to expire this time, but we learned not to predict anything from the pandemic, but we have had ex uh, discussions with John and, and they are aware and are prepared to be able to handle it to the best of their ability. Thank you. A couple of comments. Uh, again, lots of good things said tonight. It's been a long 23 months, very difficult months. It's been a fluid situation, it remains fluid. Nothing's different about the situation after tonight. So I just want people to keep that in mind. Julie just said some really nice things about we can quickly move back if we need to. And that's not a threat, that's just a reality. For 23 months, we've been adjusting day to day, week to week, 
by what's happening around us, both in our community and beyond our community. One thing I keep coming back to is Dr. Hillman writes often um, about being proud of how we were conducting ourselves. And I think at least two board members tonight, maybe three had recognized the students who emailed us over the weekend. And I'm incredibly proud of them uh, for what they stood up for and what they believe in. And they're not gonna get what they want tonight. And I think that's okay, it's a lesson, but it's gonna be difficult for them. And for six months, if not longer, we've been dealing with people who think this is a two-sided issue and it's not a two-sided issue. We've heard comments for six months and really <laughs> more than six months about people who have very unique situations, very difficult situations. And I think it's important we recognize that. I'm proud of those students, just as I was proud of the student who was here tonight speaking. Unfortunately, I'm very ashamed of and embarrassed by a number of the adults in the audience tonight who laughed at that student. And I just want them to think about how that student may have felt tonight when she came to speak about her truth and the difficulty she's gonna be facing on the 22nd of February when she walks into school in a very different situation. So I would challenge our entire community to be their best selves and to treat others with respect just as others have expected for 23 months. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. Anybody else, comments, questions? Julie? I just have one last comment, and that's our, our ex extending our uh, sincere appreciation to the command team. Um, when I was um, board chair, I, I served on that command team, and, and Claudia is serving on it now. And um, to know firsthand and to see the work of that group is truly incredible. And uh, we are so grateful that we had an emp epidemiologist, a local physician, we had um, representatives of the teachers, the education, uh, educational assistants, those boots on the ground who saw these things play out, and the local physician who sees things play out at the, at the local Northfield level, level at the clinic, and then an epidemiologist who was able to advise on, on overall trends and, and how um, Omicron and Delta were gonna play out. So the, the work of that group can really not be under, you know, it, it's, it's just invaluable. And we can never really repay them for the, for the work that they have done and continue to do at 7 a.m. on a Thursday morning. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. Amy. I was looking at the clock and realizing that we're getting close to nine o'clock and I don't know exactly when I should do this, but I, I wanted to make a motion to continue past nine o'clock, if that's okay with people. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to the motion to go past nine? Thank you, Julie. Okay, all, and then a vote on that. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we will go past nine. Thank you. Any more comments or, or questions? Well, it's hard to follow up. Um, everybody's made such excellent commentary. Um, and what I want to share, I mean, obviously in agreement with, with so much of that's already been shared, um, but just personally, um, some of the things that, and I, I'll just shoot them off, I don't have an eloquent way of sharing this, but just some of the things that have helped me process this change is, um, I know that our community is not shy to come out and, and give us their opinion. We saw some nights where we had nine, 10 people sharing that they encourage us to keep the mask mandate, to not change our protocols. Um, and we did get several emails from students, um, as other board members have stated, um, sharing their opinions with us and, and their concerns. Um, so that gives me, that gives me confidence um, to update the protocols, having heard and not heard from, um, community members, especially school um, stakeholders. Another thing is um, just the recognition that I have held, um, you know, some of my, my identity has come from wanting to take care of all of my neighbors and my community, you know, my community by wearing a mask and wearing it properly and moving on to a, a higher quality mask. But that was really founded on the, those circumstances before we had vaccines available. And so um, I just feel like I wore the mask initially to protect those 
individuals, all of us who couldn't get vaccinated, but you know, now we're in a place where the vaccine is available and better quality masks are available. And so um, if, I, if I am true to holding on and to science, then the science is telling us right now that the rates are going down, that more people are protected at our schools, um, and it, that it's okay um, to move into this next phase of allowing people to choose if they want to continue using some of those tools. Um, and just one more, <laughs> um, that the data does change so quickly and it's unsettling. It, it feels like we're not on solid ground because we uh, accept, embrace, and, and, you know, just, are so faithful to the recommendations and then they change on us and that can feel very upsetting. Um, but again, if I hold truth to following the science, when it updates, then I need to follow that, you know, as unsettling as I can feel because the science changes so quickly and it has updated. Um, and Dr. Hillman, your leadership throughout these last school years has been stellar. You have been, able to communicate with staff and community members. I see you emailing us, um, our community members, our students, our staff members, um, and always staying hopeful and positive and listening. Um, and I think that that makes a big difference. So I'm just thankful for your leadership through these uh, very, very tough years. When I, <clears throat> when I chose education as a field, I did it because I wanted to serve the public. And I've been really reflecting over the last several months about public service and what it means. And uh, you don't sign up for the public service that you want. You sign up for the public service that is handed to you. So it has been a privilege, um, not a fun privilege, I want to be clear, but it has been a privilege to get in this place at this time to do this work here. And we're not done. We have a long way to go, but this is a good step in the right direction. And so I appreciate the very kind comments. Do I want to come just two more items? Several people have brought up the concern about making sure that our neighbors and our friends are treated with respect. That is unequivocal, right? We know that we are a microcosm of society. So we do know that there will be some things that happen uh, as we move to this mask recommended but optional environment. I've spoken with our building principals who are fully prepared, not only to pre-teach, right? How we handle this kind of change, but also to enforce that if we have people who behave poorly, we have a student citizenship handbook that does govern that. And this kind, any kind of harassment or bullying for students who continue to choose to wear a mask or choose not to wear a mask, we have to respect that both ways, will be dealt with sw swiftly um, and done as a learning opportunity uh, by our building principals who are incredibly skilled at student management. And I do wanna emphasize the, uh, the availability of higher quality masks for people to protect themselves in a mixed masking environment. So for people, if you have a concern as we move to a mixed masking environment in our school, K95 masks are available across from all sorts of different entities. Uh, for people who are able to have one, uh, N95s are also now available and free. And Rice County, I didn't even know that such a thing existed, but there's apparently an N99 that you can actually get. And so the calculus has also changed that people do have greater tools to be able to protect themselves individually. So for the board members who I am so uh, grateful for your concern for our student experience and for um, acknowledging you know, students who have spoke their mind about this for, for whichever perspective, we are trying to get people, if you remember our mission, our vision says that we are gonna try to put people who are ready to engage in their society, right? And so this is an important group of, of students who are gonna remember this. This is a lifelong lesson, right? For how we adjust and deal with systemic and, and um, really significant disruption. So I do know that our educational team uh, is prepared to handle any of those kinds of incidents. I'd like to tell you that they won't happen. They will. I can tell you that for sure. And it's not a matter of, we will do what we can to prevent it. But what we will do is if we, for in the circumstance where we can't prevent it, we will intervene and we will support those students. So that's what we've got for you. So again, these are going to effect on February 21st, should the board approve them this evening. Thank you. Good. More comments or questions? Okay, seeing no further discussion, we'll now take a vote. 
All those in favor of updating or changing the COVID-19 protocols, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion passes. We have updated protocols. We now move on to items for information. We have an enroll enrollment report from Dr. Hellman. Would you like to make any comments now? Um, if you'll just give me one moment to get to that enrollment report. You'll see that we uh, did go down by a few students from 3809 uh, last month to 3792 this month. Um, some of those students may have shifted uh, to some of the ALC programming where it's more of a part-time component, but that is where we are at this month. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Corey. I see Portage increased by 18 students. Do they come from within the district or outside of the district? So my latest understanding is it'd be, it would be a mix. We did have some students who did shift um, with Omicron uh, where they shifted from uh, the in-person programming to the Portage programming. And then we have still, we've continued to pick up a handful of students from other districts. But I would say the majority of them, Corey, are coming from within the district. Which is what I expected. Are they making a commitment for the rest of the year to belong to Portage or can they shift back at some point? Yeah, so we ask people to make that semester commitment. Um, that's an important piece for us. Uh, it isn't that we can't work with certain individual situations, but we're up, up front and transparent with people that the on-ramp is that they need to commit for the semester. Any other comments or questions? Okay, this concludes our business meeting tonight. Thank you board members for your excellent level of engagement. I'm grateful for your commitment to our community. We um, process a lot of critical issues and topics every meeting and I know that you're, please know that your thoughtfulness is always noticed. Our next meeting, will, our next meetings will be Mondays 6 p.m. on February 28th, March 14th and March 28th in the district boardroom. Is there a motion to adjourn? Okay, moved by Noel, second by Amy. Thank you all those in favor. Bye. Opposed. All right, we are adjourned.